Hello and welcome to the World Cup final in orienteering where we're all set for the last two individual races of this World Cup 2021. Here we're in the Dolomites in Italy for two middle distance races, first with the men and then with the women. They're going to be tackling this course to earn their final World Cup points and we'll see who takes the overall win. It is still up for grabs in both the men's and the women's competitions today so should be set for an exciting series of races. We've already had the uh, long distance at this World Cup final which was a couple of days ago. There's some highlights of that now up on YouTube and up on online. If you wanted to check out some of the pictures and the results from some of that we saw Casper uh, Foster and Tova Alexanderson taking the wins in those. Will they be able to make it two from two? Well it's certainly the they're certainly in with a good chance. They're going to be, we're in the same arena that they were in for the long distance um, a couple of days ago, but in dif different terrain. They're on the other side of the forest, up on these hills with some technical uh, contour detail, but it's quite, visibility is quite good. Runnability is very good. We saw the men taking on 19 kilometers a couple of days ago and the women 13 kilometers running really, really quickly through the terrain. Hopefully it should be set for an exciting race. These are the standings though, and uh, Jonas is here to chat uh, through them with me. Of course, we've got Casper Fosser at the top of the standings, but he's not won it yet. No, it's uh, but there's a very big chance for him to win it because the gap is really, really big and uh, we have seen the shape he's in it at the moment he won the race, the long distance race you named uh, before with more than five minutes so well I actually think I mean there's a big chance for him to win it for sure and he's the big favorite and um, I don't know what has to happen more than a miss punch that he won't make it today I, I see him definitely as the big favorite yeah yeah, me too. One person on that list who we don't have here is Gustav Bergman. He's decided not to come out to this competition. Yeah, he decided to stay at home. He um, There was a lot of time abroad, he mentioned, when he was publishing it. And uh, he wants to spend a bit more family time, so he didn't travel down to Italy. Uh, of course, uh, pity for us, but, uh, well, I guess a good decision. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he said that wasn't wasn't going to make the trip down to Italy. Um, but we do have a few other names kind of in that top 10. Um, Adam Heimdahl as well is in there. Lucas Leland, a few youngsters. Joey Haddon as well. Uh, but let's, though, talk through this course mm. and have a look at the map, Jonas. Well, you can see it. We are in the part of the very last part uh, from the long distance. So it's very detailed. You named it. Runnability is good. It's a bit... Uh, less good than it was in the long distance especially in the beginning there so it's a bit more stony a bit more rocky here it's a very rhythmical course uh, you often get these three controls approximately the same distance uh, away from each other then a little bit a longer one and then three controls uh, again so you have them grouped together um, many changes in direction here that makes it a bit more difficult for the runners and then you have this long leg here 14 to 15 uh, in my eyes I guess uh, it will be kind of decisive because it's one of the controls where you actually can have um, different route choices on the other ones many of them you will have micro route choices but basically uh, straight on so 14 15 for sure uh, interesting one we will have two TV controls um, or parts where we follow the runners it's between control 4 and 6 and 12 to 14 and of course uh, towards the finish where we have a lot of time to follow them uh, out in this open area yeah, so that's the overview of the course. Let's have a look at some of the kind of more intricate parts of it. We're going to have a look at some of those um, uh, different route choice options that we've got. But it seems uh, so it's uh, 5.1k, 250 meters of climb. Let's have another kind of closer look then and pull out some of the, the more tricky bits. So three to four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
It's it's one of these, yeah, I named it before, they are often grouped together in like three controls and then a bit a longer one. This one is actually one of the longer controls. I think that still, I mean, if you think back to the long distance race, uh, we had options like this, but even there it was fastest to go straight on. Uh, I guess it will be the same here today as well. Straight is always an option and I think it's a, it's a good option. Maybe it's a bit more technical to go straight, um, but well, we are at the World Cup final, so the runners here they can handle that I expect them to go quite straight and then that we will have micro route choices uh, in some parts yeah you've got just these micro route choices like which uh, crags you're gonna go between here you can see how steep it is but uh, just how visible everything is you can really pick out all of the uh, the features here so you're mm -hmm. just going kind of above the crag here you can see the big depression on on the left and then going up this re-entrant here everything's pretty defined i think at this point yeah um i mean we mentioned it before the runnability runnability maybe not the very best but the visibility is so good it makes the speed uh, it makes it easier to have a, a good speed in the terrain difficulty today uh, you have many contours on the map and you have to figure out on which uh, side of a hill the control is location located uh, is it a depression is it a hill uh, it looks easy when you're zoomed in or easy it looks easier when you're <laughs> zoomed into the map here but uh, if you're running out in the terrain and you have uh, you have it not zoomed in it's quite a task to figure out kind of uh, generalize the map and find the features you will want to use for your navigation here. Yeah, you can just see when you zoomed out to the map there just how detailed it is. When you when you zoom in here, you can see a lot more of the of the features and everything, but they are, you know, they are they're big, they're well-defined features, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's knowing what's up and, and what is down and reading that detail. And I mean, if you look at the map here, you see many features on the map, but if you look in the terrain, it's actually quite clear contours, and that's exactly what you have to do. You have to filter out the map and just use the big contours for your navigation. Yeah, and that's going to allow you to get the, the good speed, the good high speed, and not be slowing down too much to kind of make sure you're taking in all of that detail as well. And then there's this long leg, of course, 14 to 15, uh, potential different options here? Uh, yes, you have different options. Um, I guess they will go for the blue one, most of them. Um, yeah, visibility is good and runnability is okay. Maybe it's a bit stony in some parts, but it's also stony if you run around. Um, maybe you get some tracks there, but I, I expect them to go quite straight here. Yeah, I think that's what we saw, as we said, from the long distance race, even though, you know, there was big parts of climb you could avoid. A lot of a lot of the runners were sitting, sticking really, really close to the red line. And I think when the legs are shorter here in this middle distance race, it's just going to continue that way as well. So we're looking through, looking through the start list then. Um, and of course, they they are off in the order of the World Cup standings. So Casper Fosser currently leading the World Cup standings will be going last. But of course, big teams we've got out here, some with you know six, seven, eight uh, runners. So they will be kind of ticking off, and we'll get to some of those um, better ones uh, towards the latter end of the competition uh, as we tick through all of these different nations. Uh, anyone else? Anyone you want to pick out? Anyone we may be looking at? At an earlier runner to uh, set us a quick time. Mm, uh, I mean, we have uh, Olav Lundenes who is starting quite early, already at uh, yeah seven past one. Um, because uh, uh, you named it, it's the it's the world ranking or the World Cup standing, and he was injured in many of the races, so he starts quite early today. Um, when we are talking about the big favourites, I would say they are at the very end, of course. Emil Svensk, uh, Joey Haddon, Daniel Hoopman, Matthias Kibbutz and uh, Kasper Fosser. But there are many names here uh, can perform very well. We have seen that in many races in middle distances uh, in the men's class. 
Um, so, yeah, it will be exciting. And this is the leader at the moment, Nicolas Rio. And you see the time, 35 minutes and 20 seconds. And expected winning time of 35 minutes. So yeah. it is a fast race today. I, I think it will go... Uh, well, it would be a surprise if he would win it. So I think uh, we will go down a little bit more in the winning time or in the running time. So uh, pretty fast race today. Yeah, pretty fast race um, compared to the long distance where I think we just the last two, um, Kasper Fosser and Tove Alexandsson, both winning by over five and a half minutes. Um, they were the only ones to get anywhere near close to that winning time. It was a really long one. I think, yeah, you're right. This is going to be much quicker. You've got a lot of descent, especially in the last kind of section of the race. And then the last... Uh, it's kind of like 500 meters even is all just kind of running across these fields to be towards the same arena so um there's kind of going to be a lot of just dead running at the end to be fair um on this course uh so yeah nicola rio again hasn't um done much uh this year meaning he was very low in the world cup standings one of our early starters but we'll pick the race up with kenny kivakas from estonia here and also one of the early starters that we missed out on the list, Martin Regborn from Sweden, who um, has had a lot of injuries this year, hasn't raced. Um, I think he, he was part of the team who went to the World Cup in Sweden, but didn't finish there. So um, won't have very many points, but had a great, um, I think it was a top 10 result yesterday for him. So another one of those early uh, runners who we mm -hmm. could see uh, doing really, really well. Yeah, he ended up on fifth yeah, he was place. Fifth. Yeah, yeah. But uh, he's kind of, yeah, man, he's of course, uh, surprised you, you say he's starting very early. It's, yeah, we have to wait quite uh, many minutes for him to start. <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, but of course, he's one of the earlier. He's a bit starting a bit earlier, and uh, earlier than this group I named uh, in the very end. So Mikhail Kuleshov is on his way to split number one. So we'll get split one at control uh, number six. After, as you said earlier, just kind of a, f a few controls very close together. And I think anybody, any runners who've been on the World Cup circuit for quite a while will, or even, even not even very long, will know that when you've got controls quite close together, those are very likely to be ones mm -hmm where there are TV cameras. But actually, look, if you look underfoot, you can already see it's tracked up quite a lot going through some of that greener undergrowth through there. Mm, uh, of course, it will be tracking up a bit where you have the grass on the ground, but here in parts like this when it's stony and, um, I mean, there's no vegetation on the ground, more or less. Uh, it's So that here it won't be, it won't tracking up. And of course, you will see uh some of the footsteps from runners before because the controls are quite short um close to each other so they're all heading out into the same direction so exactly at the control and just before the control you always see a few tracks yes yeah, so that was uh, kuleshov just punching control number five and we are just i think the other side of control number six you should see him come past this boulder that's a good uh, step on the way into the control and he was see plus six seconds at control number four that's where we have anton johansson from sweden leading at that point uh and it's aro eho leading for finland currently at uh, this sixth control our first tv split and then straight back down out of there let's have a look at some of the tracking Mm -hmm. And you see here, uh, already from the start, short controls. That's a bit of a tricky one because you have no time to get into the race, to get used to the to the mapping. Of course, uh, many of the runners here have been running uh, the long distance already. But it, it's a different scale and not all of them have been running the long. Um, so it can be a bit tricky and also here we see they go more or less straight. They use this small path there to get some help on the way. But once you get close to the control, the visibility is good. You see the controls from quite far away. That's the point where we have seen uh, Kuleshov in the picture between 4 and 6. 
Bit bad direction out from the control, from the Russian runner there. And now we are waiting for Vaso Kupa from France. And now we are at split 2. So we are at the controls 12 to 14. So we see, yeah, Vansel Kupa lost some time. He was quicker than the current leader at the finish, Nicola Rio, at control number six. And you see it here, the control point is actually, it's, it's, ac it's actually really easy. So I, I think that's kind of the thing today. It's mm -hmm. not about really... Uh, finding the control points if you get close to the control you will see it but it's all about do the navigation uh, on the way to the control and do it in a way that you can be running uh, in an attacking manner all the way um, and not having to read all the details on the way you have to generalize the map filter out all the unnecessary details and make it as easy as possible for you Let's see here, we have it towards oh, control, control 10. No. Maybe the 11 yeah, looks then. pretty good so far. Yeah. No. Let's see. But he's I mean, we have seen that he has lost time between the with first our, our TV split like and the second one Very here. Obvious. So at one point, I guess he must have done a mistake. Here is a, here he's a, a bit too low and hesitating a bit or at least losing time in the uphill. This is Noat Spinden from Switzerland. Took his first World Cup points in the long distance. Ended up on 35th position. start and then disappearing into the darkness. <laughs> so Magnus Stewart here and shortly arriving at the sick control I think. Mm. And you're really the thrown tools. into the orienteering here. And, you know, there's there's a few c very short controls very quickly. It's kind of, let's not mess around, get straight to plunging you into this detailed orienteering. Mm, but right at the point where he's at the moment, it's actually quite, uh, yeah, I was about to say it's quite easy because you punch the control <laughs> at control five, you're at the lowest point there. If you take direction, uh, out and you lift your head to get to see the features around you. You can see really see the two hills and you have just to run over it. You can see it here between control 5 and 6. Uh, just get between two hills there and then you get kind of a line towards the control. So it's actually quite... If you take your time and uh, figure out what you want to see be really exact with the direction, uh, then it's not too difficult. But I think that the, the big challenge today is how to be really fast on this one, because it is tricky, um, it needs some coordination to run into in this stony area, you see it here, and then to be able to run in an attacking manner, I think that's the, the challenge today. So here's Kenny Kivikas, who we saw at the start. And you've got to try and yeah pick your way through these sections, be really confident. You can see every it's every time you look at his map, uh, you can see it slows down. Um, it slows and, down. And it, it's very interesting to see because you, you saw the two runners there and uh, Kivikas, he looked much more 
uh, attacking, but at the same time he was not faster. At just at this point, he kind of tried to attack, and then he had to stop and re was reading the map again. And he, they were about the same speed. Um, so that's a bit what I wanted to to mention before. If you have control and you kind of maybe can skip one time, you can have you have contact with the map and instead just focus on attacking in in uh, in the physical part. Then I think you can win some time here. Yeah, and and also at a on a course where we don't think we're gonna we don't think we're gonna see too many like big big mistakes then it's all about yeah just a few seconds here and mm. there and and if you're you know if you're consistently losing like two seconds of control mm. what we've got 20 controls here on the men's course that's 40 seconds gone straight away mm. of course uh, and i mean you, you mentioned a good point there when we Think back to races where we see runners making big mistakes. It's always in parts where the visibility is very mm -hmm. low and it's you don't have many features. And once you're a bit off direction, uh, it's hard to re relocate. And mm -hmm. it's really not the case here because you have so many features uh, that help you relocating. Uh, you don't have this yeah, disturbing part with low visibility that under. gets you off track. So. As you said, it's really not. I don't expect them to make big mistakes here. Of course, you can miss a control by 20, 30 seconds, but we won't see. Oh, yeah. Now I, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm making a prognosis here. Maybe, but I, I don't <laughs> expect them to to make very big mistakes here. No, uh, but but it's as you're saying. It's the it's that amount of detail which means and the visibility which means your not going to make big mistakes but you really have to work hard to get that speed really high because there's so much detail and because you can see a lot of it as well you can get overwhelmed with just how quite how much information there is to take in and you've got to be able to process and deal with all of that so it's almost like that this is quite an extreme part which makes it a difficult to do big mistakes because these orienteers are so good but also makes it really hard to keep a really high speed through out here as well but Aro Eho from uh, Finland who's making his uh, World Cup debut age of 22 uh, has caught up Mark Sarayon Garquez from Spain the two of them running together so uh, it's pretty good and he was uh, looking great early rounds. I think I wonder if we don't have GPS tracking from Nicola Rio, which is why we haven't seen him on the uh, tracking actually. Um, but he's certainly made some good time, and it's going to be one we're going to be comparing uh, against uh, a lot of the other runners against. But now they are into the finish line here. It's like a long, long run for home here. And I think we're going to see a lot of, we saw a lot of people a couple of days ago collapsing across the line. I think it's going to be exactly the same thing, but uh, the Finn goes into third place there. 46 seconds slower than Nicola Rio, who, as we said, was at 35.20 is the current leading time. So we'll have a little look back at the tracking then from the Finn and the route choices through here this looks like a let's go straight oh no let's bail out to the path kind of uh tactics mm. but then he's actually not even sticking much on the path i wonder if the gps is slightly off yeah it was quite a straight route by aho i think he i mean he used uh, he stayed up on the hill there to get out to avoid some up and down parts in the beginning and then he used a small track towards the control running between the hills or uh, by the hill there just in the middle of the control and you see those three different options here or you could have seen it and uh, here in the very end uh, I mean the more or less the run-in starts at control 16 because to 17 you just follow the counters to the control yep. and then same to 18 and then here you yeah, you have to change gear again and really speed up as much as possible. There you can just try to get out everything you have left in the in your body. 
to the control and you have actually a lot of time to do so. Yeah, you do. But after a, a knackering long distance, yes, it was a couple of days ago. They have had a, a rest day in between. That's still... You, that it was a very long, long race for a lot of the runners out there if you're not in the top 10 runners. Um, so that will surely have kind of played, played a toll on the body. Mm -hmm. Here we see a comparison there. Tail is 60 seconds. So let's see how this will go. We see that Aho would, he chooses to take the track there for some meters. The gap was about 80 seconds I think and here we see that Koopa got stuck in the stony area there it's a bit of the risk when you go totally straight there through those this dotted area here again he goes through the dotted area of course it's very stony there but I would say he lost about one minute here between control 14 and 15 or at least at least 30 seconds to a minute yeah yeah, yeah. And you've got to be careful not to add too much distance as well if you're going kind of a, like around a lot of these very round shaped depressions or hills. Then if you're yeah. wiggling around too much, you're really going to be adding the distance on quite quickly. Yeah, and if you go around, you have to be sure that you will be able to win it back later on. Of course, if you go, if you go around and have to get through stony areas anyway and have to do climbing anyway, then uh, go straight from the beginning. So uh, that's a bit the problem here. You seen in uh, Koopa's route there, he got stuck in the stony area. So he was running around. Of course, he could uh, maybe avoid some climbing, but he got really into the worst part when it comes to the stony areas. And uh, that's where he lost time here. Now we are with yeah, Noat Spinden. He slowed down. Yep, Noat Spinden mm -hmm. then into uh, split number one. Mm -hmm. but he must must have done a mistake here in the beginning. Already almost one and a half minutes behind. Yeah, and just kind of that hesitation out of the control speaks a lot too. I mean, pretty much everybody else we've seen heading, you know, a bit more to the right, straight out of the control, down to the road, which we can pretty much see from that camera position there. Mm. So um, that's quite... Mm, I mean, it's yeah. something when you have such open terrain and you have so good visibility the moment you see the control you have to switch towards the next control so that you really when you punch the control you know where to go you can even take a, a glimpse into the terrain and take a look where it is good to run out from the control uh, it's not it, it doesn't make a very big difference but of course uh, as you mentioned before if you do it uh, at every control 20 times and you win 20 or lose two seconds every time then it's yeah it's summing up in the end um, and it also gives you a good flow it gives you a good feeling to be able to just keep on running at the control and if you don't have to stop but uh, the stop and go it's really sometimes it's really smart to do uh, in some parts but it also gives you the feeling that you're not too fast and uh, it's it's always good to have a good feeling, especially in in a terrain like this, where it's where the visibility is so good. Yeah, but I guess the the advantage of the stop and go means you know you're if you, if you keep if you keep going and you you go but in the wrong direction, yeah, that can really like badly influence that the whole of that leg just from your the the exit direction of the control. Mm, of course, so, but um, the, yeah, but the stop and go in a terrain like this, where you mm -hmm. can see the features quite long ahead of you it's not really necessary because you you can see 50 100 meters in front of you so you can lift your head take a look run in this direction you're sure that you have the direction and then you can continue doing it and always take step by step so you kind of you don't need to stop and if you have terrain where it's the visibility is very low and you have to be really careful with the direction because um, yeah, in green areas it's very easy to, if you have to uh, round some features, some fallen trees or whatever, it's very easy to lose direction and 
then it can be a good thing to do some stop and go and maybe read the map for some meters and then stop again and do the map reading again. But here you should be able to do it while running. So Vassal Cooper and Nicola Rio just going to examine the map, having a look. I think they're looking at the long leg, potentially, I think from 14 to 15. And you can see the mag use of the magnifier there, that's got to be a, a good idea for a lot of people today. Right, Ruto Eka then here for Switzerland is uh, 24 seconds down at control number four. is the uh, fifth control. Mm -hmm. So now I can spot the control, so you should already know direction out. Takes another look at the map. Quite okay. Go over a few meters into kind of the wrong direction, but we didn't see, maybe had to run some fallen wood or fallen trees there. Reading the map here in the uphill. Soon see him. There we go. Come over. Mm. You could really see when he spotted the control there. So now he should use this time to prepare. But I think that was what he was doing already in the uphill. So here you can see that he is really s smoothly through the control. He used the time in the uphill there to prepare the ne next leg. He was pretty sure that he will see it when he comes over the hill there. It's really good. Here we have them, uh, the GPS comparison. We had uh, maybe a bit. That's some Cooper going around in yeah. the there. Yeah. Here we see that uh, Ekir is actually taking the route around. Wow. See if it's paying off. At least he didn't lose a lot of time. Maybe, a uh, let's say, yeah. 5 to 10 seconds there. So back with uh, Magnus Dewitt from Denmark, who I think has caught up Lucas Patscheider from Italy. There's quite a, uh, a lot of young Italians making their World Cup debuts uh, on in this home race. I've got a big team out there and uh, Patscheider is one of those. And of course, it's always a boost to have caught up your uh, minute man. Caught up your, mm -hmm. or I think it's a two minute start interval, isn't it, today? So uh, to have caught up that bit at that time. We can look back at the Dane in green. Mm, See behind the mistake there. Oh, mistake here. Yeah, he was, he was running down there and thought he was running into this other depression there, close to control nine. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it's very. It's still even if you have good visibility, it's it's very uh, necessary to look at your compass to have right direction down there because uh, 
as we have seen, if you if you just go over the spur there down into the slightly wrong direction, you can end up in a wrong depression there, and then it's yeah, it's still easy to to parallel mistakes, which at that point was very unnecessary because you also had this path just before the control. I don't know what you think about this, but I think sometimes there's a tendency when you've got a lot of contour features like this, that you're so focusing on the contours that sometimes the compass goes out the window a bit. Um, maybe. I mean, it, it depends a bit on what kind of runner you are. Some of the runners, they just use the features kind of instead of the compass. So they are reading they were the way through the terrain without mm -hmm. really focusing too much on the on the compass and the others are really relying on the compass and on direction uh, here this terrain is kind of a borderline thing because the contours and the hills they are so high that it's kind of yeah you can't just take direction and run then you will just go up and down all the time so you have <laughs> to do kind of both um, and at one, at some points, uh, especially downhill, then it's very tempting to n to ch kind of think that you can just use the features. And if you only use the features, uh, of course that's uh, that's a risk because if you if you do a mistake and and you think this is the hill to the right, but it's actually the one to the left on the map, so then you do this small mistake maybe it's only 20 30 meters but you can uh, uh, yeah be ending up doing a big parallel mistake in the end so it's it's a tricky thing especially in t in terrain like here where you have to do kind of a mix uh, between the techniques but it's easier here to read the features from the beginning uh, of course yeah, because they are so distinct is. That was Jakob Glonek through there. He's uh, maybe more of a sprinter, ninth in the world champs. Obviously home soil for him. Um, but now we will look to Olaf Lindenez, of course, because um, has for so long been the master of the long distance, six long distance uh, world titles. He's not had a great year this year with injury. In fact, I think he pulled out of the world champs uh, middle distance race, was focusing on the long distance race. Uh, and finished 17th. He was also uh, 23rd in yesterday's long distance uh, race. So significantly down on his, uh, you know, on his best form at the moment. We know he's been struggling with injury. So we'll see what he's able to do today. He will, of course, attack it. But it's it's hard. I guess it's hard to come to a race like this on the world stage knowing you're not at your best, you're not at your top fitness and and kind of knowing how to, to orienteer like that as well and then how to be satisfied with your performance when you rightly have such high standards for your competition. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what Olaf Lindeners can do. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, uh, he ended up in 23rd position on uh, uh, Thursday. Uh, and I mean, but maybe the, the race there was too long. Of course, if you're not in your best shape uh, a long distance like it was uh, uh, there it's it's very tough so maybe he he has uh, like higher expectations for this middle distance because uh, if he does a clean race technically if he just gets the rhythm and can do a good race um, here I think even if he's not at 100% if he's at uh, 90 95% he can end up in a really good position here we see actually a mistake mm. Art and pop off. yeah I think he saw must have seen the track down there and on, on it was too much is, not, is the control in there I'm not really sure uh, where he's come down to at this point but back with Kenny Kivakas over towards split number two. So control number 14 for the men. Taking the climb and then it's a lot of downhill from here. But, oh gosh, you can see 
some mistake must have been made at somewhere because he was only a minute and 18 down and now he's six minutes 34. What were we just saying about people not really making mistakes? And then we've just seen quite a few. What? Yeah. Okay, don't listen yeah. to what we say. <laughs> uh, Let's say we we were talking about about the runners in the very end maybe yeah no we will we will see that because <laughs> i don't think we will see many mistakes from the runners right at the end but kivaka seems to be making this one look pretty easy and then of course you've got this long leg as well and those we've seen punches control already we've seen them stop for quite a long time at this uh control just getting uh exactly where they're going so the same seems like Kivakas is doing the same. Ralph Street, though, here. This is uh, control number uh, four, I think. And he's 32 seconds down off the pace at the moment. Looking to see, it's still Anton Johansson from uh, Sweden, who's the, the le who's the leader at control number four. And so Ralph Street, who uh, lives in Oslo, was 36th uh, in the long distance. He's actually got Brit off uh, straight after him as well. Hector Haynes coming through next, who was 33rd on the long distance. Middle distance, though, is his best. Uh, what we've seen his best performances at at a World Championships. He was 13th in 2018 over in Latvia. We'll soon see him drop down into this control. Yeah, a good so part here. So tenth, yeah. Yeah, it caught the, up 12 seconds. Yeah. yeah, really good. It, it looked very distinct here. No hesitation, no stopping at controls very smoothly through the controls. And let's see here in the beginning. Um, rounding there as well. Maybe a bit much. Uh, we've seen that before by Vincent Coupa, I think it was. And then uh, here we have oh. the reason why he was bit behind I guess in the beginning seen Rito Ecker doing the same he lost about let's say 10 seconds there let's see if it's the same for Ralph Street yeah it's might be even more here maybe half a minute I think he lost all of his of the time he was behind at control 4 he's lost to this on this longer route towards control 4 yeah, but just but we're just making up twelve seconds on those uh, those mm. few controls from four to six. That just kind of, I guess, shows you he's got some good pace through the terrain. But yeah, that that route choice uh, costing that point. So Lias Kuka from Finland, off here, and here's uh, Hector Haynes. Living out in Sweden, there's quite a few Brits competing at the on the international circuit who live outside the UK. Here's another of them, but he is uh, a little bit further down at Control Four, plus one seventeen. So not made the same start as uh, Ralph Street. You could almost see he wasn't quite expecting, maybe not quite expecting that, just having to take another look just to get the confirmation that, that is the control. Or maybe kind of looking to see where he was going. Now he'd seen that control in the distance, looking to see where he had gone out of it. I think that was what he does, because no need to look at the map on his way out there. Now takes a look on the heading up uh, this slope.
Hector's got a his best middle distance race comes at World Champs anyway, 10th at uh, the World Champs in 2015, which was home soils in Scotland. But here's Olaf Lindenez. Mm, he lost some time he's here in the down. beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe we get some GPS later. Actually, a lot of those leading or doing well at this point in the course, like uh, Aro Aho from Finland, like um, Matthias Petter from Austria, who was third at this point, have kind of lost more gaps. So there's there's a lot of those who's been who've had good starts, who've then kind of come and stuck later on in the course. So even if you're a little bit further down at this point, I think it's not too bad at least not at this point i think once we get to the the last 10 guys you're going to really have to be uh right up with the leaders um even at this first tv split but looking good for lindes through just down through there mm -hmm. here we are with rito ecker lost some time here he was uh, one of the starters who had a good time there at control six he was 17 seconds behind that then at control 12 149 behind. Also here hesitating, doing a mistake. Oh, and it's the worst thing you you can see. He's just wanting to turn his back on the camera and uh, change direction there. And now we have to keep calm here with the camera in your face. That, that's a big mistake here. So what yeah, is going all the way back out going? to the road. Mm -hmm. that now is close, I guess. There it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a big mistake here. Yeah. He was nearly over at control number 14, but hadn't found 13 yet. Mm -hmm. I wonder really what happens. What happened because you have quite qu uh, clear features there. You have some um, cliffs and you have some stony parts. You have uh, contours. You also have the street there that can help you, even though if you don't really go climb up there, you can you can see it or you can kind of, um, yeah, kind of feel where it would start if you look up the the hill there. So it's there are many things if you look here between 12 and 13 that can help you uh, navigation. But let's see what happens. You should be able to see Crop. 12 quite, from quite away because it's on the underside of the that crag. Yeah, let's so let's see here. I think he tries to climb up there to this path. Didn't really get it. And then he missed the control only by a few meters. Yeah, that's a pity. I mean, he was, he was basically there. 
to think that he I don't know if he really had to right. now he oh, misses now we're live 14 so tracking. Yeah, yeah again or did he have it and heading towards 15 already maybe Maybe yeah, the I think he must have done because off. obviously yeah. he went out to the road and it didn't show him going out yeah. to the road. So I think the GPS was just like a bit off there. So it's hard really to tell, I guess, then how close he was to the control um, when we look at that. Mm, yeah, exactly. Right, Elias Kuka has made a good start and he 12 seconds down at the fourth control. And now picking up this little path on the way to the fifth. Maybe just quickly checking the direction on the exit. We're looking pretty smooth through there. Mm, and uh, I mean, we know that you there is potential to catch some time here in this part. Ralph Street caught 11 seconds here, or 12 seconds even. Kuka was 12 seconds behind, punching here, also he is able to catch a few seconds. Mm -hmm. He's faster at that point uh, compared to the leader in the finish, Nicolas Rio. Now we have uh, Jens Rönnholz here, the picture, I think he's the one we haven't seen before. So let's see what happened or what happens. So he is going around. Mm -hmm. We know that yeah, early runners like Ralph Street and uh, Reto Ecker, they lost time here. Yeah. So he is losing, let's say, 20 seconds, maybe 25 here is in the picture. was 16th in the long distance. Yeah, good result for mm. one of the Swedish team like less experienced on the World Cup circuit. Yeah, that's a, it's a good start. I mean, not the best route choice there to control four, but um, in the forest he seems, yeah, I mean he looks very fast here, very distinct in his navigation, no hesitating so far, what we have seen in the picture or on the GPS. Yeah, and that for me suggests that that will continue around the rest of the course and then kind of add up and add up and pay off ultimately um, mm. around the rest of the course. I mean, it's a pity for him that he lost about 20, 25 seconds there on the route choice. But otherwise, uh, very good start here. And that's Noat Spinden on the way to the finish. Yep, and we'll go into then eighth place here. You can see a lot mm. of that time lost early on, to be honest. Yeah. And caught up, so had a fast finish as well from control 18, which is the last one in the forest all the way to the end. So, yeah, pretty good. Just a shame about the, the beginning part of that race as we catch back up with Ralph Street, see how he's getting on uh, to the second split. And actually, it's still 
Yeah, within 30 seconds. So matching the, that time. So Nicola Rio is still our leader at the finish. And he is the leader at control number 14 as well. Valentin Novikov in second. Just kind of see him looking around here, just trying to spot it. And then a lot of that map reading you can see on the way into the control. You can see he was looking around, he spotted it, and then it was like, right, 15, which way am I going? It could be quite quick on the way out of that as well. That put him into. Mm -hmm. I think it was third in the pre warning. Let's have a little look at the, the tracking. Yeah, we're comparing here with Aho, who has the uh, fastest time at control six. It looks good here, but I mean, yeah. we one runner we don't have on here is Nicolas Rio, unfortunately, because he was he was actually having good times at every split. He was only 11 seconds behind at control four, and then he's leading from control 12 to the finish. Yeah, and I, I mean the finish time is early. yeah, and finish time is 35 minutes, so that's another uh, indicator that it was a good race by him. Mm. We had a Legnik then here, the pole. He's going to go in there alongside the German Felix Spate. So a third place there just less than a minute slower than Nicolas Rio. Okay, let's have a have look some at these couple of runners into the finish. Mm -hmm. Many of the runners choose to take this small path there, the track, it gives you some meters where you don't have to read the map too carefully. We also saw again part where Vincent Coupa got stuck in the stony area. A small mistake, Ooh, mistake here though. by yep. Olenik. Kind of went to the wrong spur. Yeah, when you're descending like that, you get, you've exactly got to keep your direction. <laughs> Teresa Chechova from the Czech Republic is the current leader on the women's course. 40 minutes and 23. Just comparing their courses. Mm -hmm. I think we are with Rudolf Sernis. He had a good start here to the fourth control. Now he's stopping. To go one more, I guess. Indeed, he was only five seconds behind at control four. Yeah, that's what I thought. He didn't really come from the same direction as mm. the other runners here. We also see that he is together with Janis Bonek. So he caught the Austrian runner. And he passes the Austrian runner here as well. 
It's quite a difference in the speed, as it seems here. Yeah, and it's looking like it might be difficult for the Austrian to, to kind of latch on to Zernis and try and keep up. It looks really solid. Mm, I think uh, Zernis would have had the potential here to take over the lead, but he just missed a little bit mm. uh, at control 5. Ricardo Scalette then here. So the best of the Italian men. We can get another look at the standings at split one. So Aho from Finland is still the leader there with those 8 minutes 33 seconds but a lot of those Antonio Hansen, Matthias Petter they've all, all come to the finish they've all lost time in the middle part of the course and they are you know not in there's a reason why we've not really been talking about them because they've not been high up enough we've got Ralph Street there who was I think in third spot when he passed through our second TV split was down at plus 20 seconds at that point so as long as you're in kind of those first two pages of the results uh, splits at that point, then that's a pretty good start. So Tim Robertson here, setting off into the terrain, much more of a sprinter is a pretty is an understatement for Tim Robertson. He uh, took a bronze medal though at the World Championships in the sprint after a, a season full of injury, managed to get back into the shape to be able to take the bronze medal in the fort in, um, in the Czech Republic. It's a really great, exciting race. But yeah, Tim Robertson not known for his forest races, quite as much as he is for the sprinting. Mm. Here we have Rito Ecker. Had a good start, but we have seen him with big problems there at between control 12 and 14, here we see it again, uh, especially at control 13. Maybe we have some correction in the GPS here in this replay compared to last time. Uh, it's the same, I guess. So I think he was a little bit more to the east there. Of course, it was very close mm -hmm. to the control. You can see that the GPS was quite off there, so it's hard to say where he mm -hmm. actually passed control 14. Oh, 13, I mean. Oh. Then he missed control 14. He really oh. did miss it there as yeah. well. And that's such a common thing, isn't it? To, uh, to make a yeah. mistake and then make another one straight afterwards. Yeah, of course, his uh, focus uh, shifted, drifted away. Uh, it would have been very interesting to see where he really passed control 13 because he must have missed it with only a few meters, but I don't think the GPS was totally right there. No. So maybe, but he must have just missed it. Uh, maybe didn't really expect it to be there because I think if you expect the control to come, um, you had the visibility so good that you should see it. So he m might have been preparing the next control already or he was just a little bit behind in the map reading and uh, lost focus just for a few seconds. But when you are when you know you were so close to the control and you missed it and yeah. you ended up but wasting a couple of minutes, it's so frustrating how, you know, you've got to try and like pick your you know your mental strength back up from that and go yeah. try and reset and 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 actually of course go, it's fine and just not be really angry <laughs> but of course the second he misses the control uh, he doesn't know that mm -hmm. he is missing by just a few meters because then he would just turn and punch it and no, 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 so it's but hard when to you say go back if, when you go back and you do yeah, find still, it and then you might realize you, oh well i was it was i was literally just there two minutes yeah ago. I mean, he That's he did a whole thing. circle there. It's hard to say if he no knew that he just passed it by a few meters. But of course, he, he does know that he was close. And uh, it's annoying. Um, it's always like waking up the feeling that you have to push more to the next control because you might mm. be able to win back time, which is kind of impossible because the only thing is you can do is lose time here uh, because you always run as good as you 
can in orienteering or hopefully you do so it's kind of the thing is that you can lose time but you can't really win back time um so you, it's kind of a, ri a risky thing to turn up the speed again but at the same time i mean you s automatically s lower the speed when you're doing mistakes so you feel that you have kind of more power in your body when you punch the control and you want to get back into this feeling where you were before you did the mistake. So usually you just overpace it a little bit just away from the control and you have to, re to be really careful to not do it. So Miros Nikodim here from the Czech Republic is also about kind of 30 seconds down at uh, control number four. You can just see refolding the map on his way up the hill. Of course, Milos Nikitin with the, he won the World Cup final middle distance, um, what was it, three years ago, 2018, when it was in Czech Republic? Or was it was like mm -hmm. four years ago, 2017. I can't remember now which year it was, but uh, that was by far his standout performance of, of his career. Uh, I think it was 2018. And you can see, yeah, he's he actually, again, like Ralph Street, had a good series of controls there, four to six, catching up quite a few seconds. So you can see some strength mm. there. I wonder if he too went out to the path on from and here. We see, it'll be interesting to see. See a new leader. We were talking about him in the beginning. He took the wrong route to control four, lost quite a lot of time there. But uh, we could see between control four and six that he really got good speed here and he. Yeah, you could keep that pace towards control 12. He's in the lead by 20 seconds here. So actually the first one uh, faster than Nicola Rio. Looks very promising for him. I think he's just looked up, seen that control. He's looking now on this long leg here. But yeah, it does look very promising. He will take the new leading time. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, talking about the leading time, here we have a new leading time at control four. Ricardo Scalet from Italy on the home soil. And at control six as well. And that was 40 second lead at uh, control number six, which is a big dent in that time. We've seen a lot of people be kind of 20 seconds outside. So Ricardo Scalette putting down a really big marker there so mm -hmm. early on in the race. And you can see and Ralph Streets catching. Yeah. Ah, now this is compared to, because now of course we've had um, Ricardo Scalette go through the first one. So he's a minute behind Ricardo Scalette at control number six, but 22 seconds behind the current leader, Nicola Rio at control number 18, which is the last one in the forest. Then there's a couple of controls of pain here. you really got to try and push it hard all the way through to the finish. But Ralph Street is doing just that. Let's punch the last control and we'll see if he's going to take a new leading time. Yes, he is. I think he is. So a really strong finish, a strong run in there because we saw he was behind. So Ralph Street goes into the new leading time there. 35.08 for the Brits. And yeah, we see that we've seen that before. Happy, Nicola Rio, yeah. he lost time in the, in the end. Mm -hmm. We had, for example, Aru Aho was 20 seconds faster. Um, so he must have done something there, or he just uh, lost a lot of time in the running there, in this running section, in the very end. Now we are with Tim Robertson, and uh, see that he lost more than a minute already in the beginning. Yeah, you can see him just pausing a few times, just trying to be extra sure.
Yeah, and again, not being quite as distinct out of the control as well. You can always see he's like kind of looking back as he exits that control. Maybe sensing he's being caught. Hmm. Mathieu Perrin starting mm -hmm. two minutes behind from France. But he don't have well, his Mathieu punch Perrin yet. had a good had a good race on Thursday with that fifteenth place, so could well see mm, but we don't have uh, his punch yet at control four, I guess. No. Nope. So no reason to look back here. But I guess we've got to we've got to compare this with. I keep forgetting we've got to compare this with an outstanding leading time though. We're by still by forty seconds, Ricardo Scalette. So even if you're, you know, a minute and eight seconds down on mm. the first place, you're only, you know, twenty eight seconds down on the second place at that split. So. can really see how much he's looking around for the big features here. Was even looking back up a hill there. Yeah, I feel like we're just not used to seeing this much visibility <laughs> on the <laughs> on the World Cup and World Champs, and yeah, you can really spot how well they're looking around. This is a interesting Only descent then here. Oh, you know, yes, indeed. Yeah, descending down to that uh, fourth control. Mm, good start. Only eight seconds behind, and now we're comparing with Ricardo Scalet. Of course, the, the Finns have a new uh, national team coach as of the end of this season. Thierry Georgiou has uh, announced his time with the, the Swedish team is up. We'll be going ahead to uh, coach the Finnish team. I was listening to the Radio Erlingen podcast with Thierry Georgiou last week and how he was saying he he wants this opportunity to kind of develop this Finnish side who often have really, really great performances on junior level. And we can see this with Oli Anaho with the multiple junior, junior titles, but then they don't quite manage to make that transition into the senior team and they aren't winning the titles. They've got, they've got quite a lot of depth in their squad that's, you know, that's reasonably good, but they're not, you know, regularly making the top tens and, and meddling and maybe that you think from their success at the junior time that mm -hmm. they should have. So it sounds like he's quite excited to be able to work with a team that has mm -hmm. a lot of potential, but not uh, yeah, quite. Of course. I think he even said it's bigger budget to kind of uh, to do <laughs> stuff with and, and wants to be try and make an impact on that team. And of course, I mean, we have been talking about this many time uh, times. Uh, Due to the good thriller results they had uh, during the last years, I mean, there's it's a very interesting mm -hmm. young team uh, here in the men's class. We have many interesting runners like Mika Kirmula, uh, Axli Ruohola, yeah, or Jonas Ahula, and also Oli Oyanao. So you have many good runners here uh, to develop, and I think there's a lot of potential in this team. Yeah, well, the way Terry Georgiou was, was speaking, he sounds like he was very much up for the challenge of developing that um, squad and uh, kind of with, with the, they have more limited resources than the, the Swedish team. He was kind of comparing it to what he used to do over with the French squad and the impact of training together and how that was able to, to bring him and alongside the other French runners at the time together. Um, he was of quite excited about that prospect so we will see whether he's able to make kind of an impact um on that side and improve them of course the, the swedish team have always been great and they continue to have top runners so uh yeah i think it should be very exciting going forwards with that finish side mm, so of course uh, felt there. a big loss for the swedish team mm -hmm. um also got some reactions there 
disappointed, of course, to lose such a big name as a coach. But they have a strong team and uh, they have many good runners, so they will continue to push each other. Here we have Gaute Staver from Norway towards control split, split number one. Let's see here. Lost quite a lot of time mm. in the beginning, 135 behind. You can see him looking up and around as well. Yeah, I can. Well, he didn't actually finish Thursday's long distance. I mean, uh, who knows why, but uh, it was a very, very tough one. And there was an opportunity maybe to kind of cut it short if you felt that it wasn't going that well, maybe saving a little bit more for today's middle distance race. It was part of a large handful who didn't finish on that long distance. But it hasn't been the best of starts for the Norwegian. And again, you can just see that hesitation, the checking of the map, just checking, not right, having the confidence that, yeah, it's going to be there or having quite spotted the control. I think it's a bit harder when you head up a little bit more to the left over that ridge. We've seen a lot of those taking the right uh, hand side to be a little bit more um, kind of direct, as it were. Another Frenchman to finish, Guillaume Elias, is on the run in now. It's not going to match the time of Ralph Street or his teammate Nicolas Rio. It could well be then a third place for him. Mm, quite a good race here. Lost uh, time already in the beginning. And I mean, if you. Uh, okay, now that we are comparing to different runners here, it's a bit disturbing. So it's <laughs> a good race here by the French runner. So Martin Wegborn then here, and he was fifth in the long distance a couple of days ago. He's not been uh, running hardly at all this season with injuries, which means comparatively for that result, he's starting quite early on. Um, so we'll see what he's able to do in the terrain. Obviously he was feeling very good, yes, uh, a couple of days ago on that long distance. I think this must be Robert Merle then mm -hmm. through here to the second split. You can kind of see how the the rocks and the slope just slows you down a lot. And I think that's Mila Schneekedem, I think, there. It is. He's also 24 seconds behind at control 12. So he had a good section there between um, control 6 and 12. No mistakes there. I think soon. Soon we should see Ricardo Scalette yeah, coming exactly. through. And I think that's what this camera op is going to go and find. Yeah, um, he might have, he might he have is, uh, thought really it was the Italian coming, following the wrong runner. There here we is. have him. And this is a really good race here. It was really, you could get the feeling. I think I was talking about that in the earlier races this year, that you get the feeling that he's getting closer. Even though we didn't have so many races last year, you could see that he was in, in the few races there actually were, he had some really good results. And uh, he was one of the runners, he could, I, I had the feeling that he, he has a great potential and uh, one day when everything, uh, like when he gets everything together, getting into places that he can have a really good results. And it seems as if he could have a good race here on home soil today. 
and how much, of course, his motivation's got to be super high for this race in particular and will maybe have put a lot more of his efforts into preparing for this, where, of course, for all the other runners, this is kind of, this is not the most important race of the season. No. Uh, but I don't think it's about the motivation. Uh, usually when, when the runners are at the starting line, uh, motivation is not the problem. But here it's about, I mean, if you're running on the home soil, it's a totally different kind of confidence you have. You've been running in this kind of terrain many times. And uh, even though if um, you might not have been training there the last months or weeks, um, you just have this advantage of thinking that you ha actually have an advantage because you have done <laughs> that before. Um, and it it makes you a bit more confident and it lets you attack the controls a bit more, um, so, which is especially, uh, we were talking about that earlier in the race, which is especially important in this kind of terrain here. So I think this for sure is one of the reasons here why we see him doing such a good race. Yeah, well put that he, you know, he, he thinks you've got, you think, even if you think you've got an advantage, you believe you've got an advantage, it just yeah, it's is, kind of a placebo. It's all part of the confidence. Confidence is yeah, so of important for orienteering. Yeah, of course. And I mean, it, it is an advantage to run on home soil, but um, you can, you kind of have it in you when you have been running so many times in this kind of terrain. Uh, even though you haven't been here for a while, you, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of like cycling. If if you're good at it once, then you, you just yeah, you will be. If you can do it once, then you kind of can do it uh, your whole life. You you know how to tackle this terrain. But that that has more of an impact though on on a race in a World Cup maybe compared to a race in um, a World Championships. And I will I was gonna. Yeah. I'll come back to that thought later because we've got Jens Ronos in here who has dropped a lot of time now uh, and, can, and he was much higher up. You can see on his uh, body language here that he must have done a mistake. He's very well aware of the fact that he lost time at one point here because he was not pushing hard to the finish. No, although he's still being pushing. Let's have a little look, see what yeah. happened then. He's choosing so to go out there. I think that's okay. That's a good option. Yeah. Going over here. That's still okay. Taking this hill as direction. Maybe a bit much to the north there. Yes, indeed. Yeah, he just got up a bit much to the north here. Losing a few seconds there. Control 15. Then the, oh, a big mistake to control 18 here. It was very close. He thought that he was too much to the west, that this other spur, I guess, tried to uh, kind of, yeah, get it right and was running into the, to like, in the, towards the wrong direction there. He thought he was doing a parallel mistake, which he wasn't doing, so he was kind of, correcting the mistake he wasn't doing <laughs> yeah yeah that's so right he exactly exactly put maybe he's seen the so those kind of gates at the bottom of the hill as well and it's when it gets nervous when you're descending into those last controls and you can kind of you can sense the end is coming but you're not quite there yet then uh that is pretty uh tricky to be honest as well so lexi niemi then here in towards the finish line and he too has lost quite a bit of time. Although, yeah, losing time kind of throughout the course. And I think once we get uh, Ricardo Scales into the next few, then he's going to be dropping down even more. Martin Regborn, though, here, climbing up then to control number four. Does that suggest to me that he went round on the track? I think so. He's the 42 mm. seconds down. And for me, if that maybe suggests he went round on the track or yeah, made a mistake. If, uh, if he was running around, I'm quite sure we'll see it very soon on the GPS. <laughs> yeah, I think we will. 
But yeah, 42 seconds down at this point. Judging by his his great performance from the long distance, that's quite a lot of time to have lost uh, at the start. But I want to go back to that home soil advantage when it's at a World Cup. Because if it was a World Champs, you know, everyone takes the World Champs so seriously in terms of their preparation. So, you know, we saw, I mean, well, so this year was a bit of a special year because of the limited travel. But, you know, pe people going and having training camps out in the terrain in the Czech Republic to try and familiarize themselves with it as much as they can. But that doesn't quite happen to the same extent for a World Cup round. Mm. So all the other competitors, you know, they'll have done the model races, they'll have done the training things that they're as much as they can do kind of in the few days ahead of the races. But you've not quite got that experience of having run on it maybe quite a few times um, over the course of maybe kind of even as a junior or early senior um, parts of your career that that maybe would be equaled out by just how much emphasis is placed on preparation for a world championships. Mm. I mean, of course, the advantage in a, in a World Cup race is bigger running on home soil, but still it doesn't change the fact that you have the confidence in you. And mm -hmm. y this one, uh, like, if you're running on home soil, I think the confidence in your ability to hand to being able to handle the terrain is bigger compared to the runners who kind of had to adapt to it to it the year before um so i think you still have this advantage but then of course uh, you have other uh factors playing in as well that you can, might be a bit more nervous because there is uh, uh, at the world championships because there is a uh, the world championships on home soil and that might <laughs> only happen once in a lifetime so yeah. there are other factors and you don't really have them in the world cup race so the world cup race is kind of relaxed i mean if there's not as much attention on it for the runner especially in italy uh, i don't think the media is so much uh, <laughs> yeah chasing him down the, the days before a, a world cup race so it's 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 kind of a relaxed situation and for him uh running <clears throat> running a world cup on home soil is definitely a good thing all right Oli Oyanaho here into control number 14 is 112 down so lost over a minute he was only two seconds behind ricardo Scalette at the sixth control so lost a lot of time there and so we're gonna mm. have a look and see so there's a mistake, mistake. there to seven yeah. just slightly overshooting and you see here, we, now here we have uh, Ranolis as well. We know that he has had a good race until the third last control, I guess it was. And here another mistake, or he got kind of stuck there, losing time, or you know. Uh, and here the GPS stopped. Yeah. I think, yeah, you're right. Just getting stuck between those rocks is really proving to be, you know, it's like you're just putting on the brake because, yeah, really going backwards when you get stuck in those rocks. Luca Bethe then, uh, will he be able to join the, the other French uh, teammates towards the top? This is, no, it looks like he's lost time here, more than a minute down at, the, at this point. I think soon we'll be seeing the likes of Milos Nikodim, Ricardo Skelet in towards the finish. The next five minutes or so. See if they're going to take new mm -hmm. leading times. We'll watch out for them. None of these young uh, Finns you're talking about. Mm, good start here. Hey. Jonas Aula. Only 13 seconds behind at control four. Still a few meters to go, maybe 20 seconds behind now. And uh, I think 
think we'll have Skelet to the finish very soon. Otherwise, Mika Kirmala out the start as well. Seventh place in the Thursday's long distance. Also seventh place at the World Championships in Middle Distance. But let's take Ricardo Scalet to the finish here. I think this will be a new best time. Yes, it will. For sure. I think this is going to be a uh, new best top two times for Ricardo Scalet and Milos Nikodim. The two of them running together. I think they're also you know, catching up more runners here as well. So they will go into the not new top two times. I think they're just catching Robert Merle as well, as well there, who we've seen. And yeah, look at that, Skelet. A whole uh, two minutes ahead of anybody else at Control 18. And that other person there is Milos Nikodim, who's just running behind him. So they are those two are significantly ahead of the current leader, Ralph Street, as well. So uh, Ricardo Skelet may be having the race of his career so far here. Really done well to catch that time and still be leading. In fact, he's still leading around the whole course. There's still another 45 minutes before we have our, even our last starters set off. But um, then we've got uh, the last two. I've never seen a horse out in a, in a World Cup uh, orienteering before. But there we go. As uh, Ricardo Scalette just powering in here. He looks really, really strong to be taking some of that distance away from Milos Nikodim and getting all those cheers from that home crowd here as he makes his way on this long, long run in all the way through to the finish line. But it is going to be a new leading time then for the Italian here in Italy in the Dolomites. It's fantastic terrain and he's really worked hard all around the course. Look, he's taken meters out of mm -hmm. uh, Nikodim as well. Collapses, <laughs> somersaults over the line. The new fastest time by a very yeah. impressive Two minutes, 41 seconds, 32, 27, and, really is good. And you could really see how satisfied he is with the run. He was pushing so far away from Milos Nikodim. Uh, and you see it there. Um, I think he can be very, very satisfied with this run. And if you look at the time, 32 minutes, 27, the expected winning time was 35 minutes. Of course, we got that indication early in the run that uh, when we saw that Nicola Rio already reached uh, 35 minutes, that we might get uh, faster times than 35 minutes. But 32, 27, that's really a good time. And as you said before, he was leading at all the TV splits here. So, uh, yeah, let's see if we find someone who's able to beat that. Yeah, that's really impressive. Here's the recap, then those standings at the finish. Ricardo Scalette and Milos Nikitin both come in to take the top two spots at this point. But that good two-minute gap then and two minutes 41 ahead of our, the old leader, Ralph Street, really starts to uh, yeah, eat into that expected winning time and really fantastic uh, performance there from Ricardo Scalette getting... Uh, some congratulations on the line from Nikodim from Mel. You know, Nikodim, he knows what it's like to, to do well on, at a World Cup on home soil and can appreciate the effort put in there. Here is Alvin Riederfeldt, though, as we look back in. As we said, the, the top runners have still yet to start, though. So mm -hmm. we will but hold the, we will uh, not get too far ahead of ourselves and see how well they're able I to would match it. definitely say that Riederfeldt also is one of the top runners. He was 12th at the World Championships. Um, and, I mean, he might not have done many mistakes here in the beginning. It's only 37 seconds, the gap between. But it is 37 seconds. So it's... Uh, yeah, it's looking promising for at least the top 10 here for Skelet. Mm, looks good here for the mm -hmm. defender as well. Um, no hesitating here either. So at this point, we saw Skelet taking some steps, walking up here to the control, checking the map really carefully. Might be one of the reasons why he lost four seconds. 
the same time you can also see that the it's sometimes good to do the map reading in the uphills and uh, because there if you just walk a few steps you don't lose as much time compared to when you do that in other parts of the race so we can compare then uh mm -hmm. felt. different routes here to control seven Oh, you know, and Riedefeld. Oh, you know what? Did a small mistake there. Seen that earlier on the GPS replay. So soon we will have. Oh, you know, to the finish as well. Just a bit here in this section, drifting away from direction. Mm. <laughs> control four, just a bit too high up the hill there. Only 20 seconds behind at control four. Yeah, and if quite a few few of those seconds just lost by being a bit too high mm. for that control, so. But you could see that he had a good route there. At control four, he was not uh, running around this route choice and the path. You can really hear him breathing as well. Maybe taking a leaf out of Olaf Londonez's book. Mm, but it's it's kind of a, a mental thing as well because it's uh, it, it's kind of a way to show yourself that you're pushing hard by doing this um, and reminding yourself to to really give everything in uh, uh, physically. It's not only I, I think they could run without <laughs> breathing that loud, but. It's kind of something you get used to, you start to do it and uh, to prove yourself that you're pushing really hard at this moment. And I guess it can kind of, yeah, but keep your focus on yourself, you know, when you mm. can hear yourself, you're not hearing distractions around, you can just remind that you need and to... And take the focus from everyone around you, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, that's also true. <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine that'd be very annoying to run next to. But Kimmler then into mm -hmm. joint third, same time as Abu Niederfeld at that point. That's not Gernot Imsien. No. It's Timo Sills. It's, yeah. Timo Sild, who was, uh, took uh, maybe a little bit of a surprise, fifth place in the long in Idra in the last World Cup rounds in Sweden. Really impressive performance for him then. Mm. And we will take then Oli Uyanho then into the finish. I remember we saw those times where he kind of, he lost lost bit of times was it control number mm. 10 i think it was control seven and small and then mr seven and then kind of getting stuck in amongst the rocks to number 10. i think it was yeah it was towards control 10. Uh, otherwise it was a good race only you know not too far behind i mean it's uh, 122 it's quite a lot of time but still he had a few mistakes there as well good yeah, speed here the second spot though and good final finishing section running that long stretch alone he will go second place so 124 so, but if you compare, he was only, you know, he was still second at control number six. Mm -hmm. So, two seconds behind Skelet at that point, then just dropping down there. Yeah, he was running much more around here towards control 15. 
gets uh, quite a good entrance there. It's not much up and down if you go that much around. Of course, it's more distance you have to run. This is Simon Imark from Sweden. A very good start here to control four, mm. only six seconds behind. Yeah, second fastest then at that point. Only Ricardo Scalette was quicker. It's 27th in the long distance. So he looks very smooth in his orienteering here. No hesitating, approaching the control or leaving the control. Mm, and that will be tight here, maybe two or three seconds behind. <laughs> Just one. <laughs> <laughs> Really tight. So yeah, one of the closest to get to Imark, uh, uh, to Skelet, sorry, and obviously Rihanna was only a couple of seconds down there, as you can see, but losing that time in the middle section of the course has pushed him down the leaderboard a bit. So Skelet still uh, with that good leading spot right at the beginning part of this course. And we were talking about the Finnish team. You see here five Finnish runners. This first page. So we've got Eskil Shinneberg here from Norway. Out of the start, sixth place in the long distance. Former middle distance world champion back from 2018. But not had a great uh, season this season. Timo still though. Again, not a blistering start, but not a not losing too much time though. There with Grace Malloy. Now he's got to be careful not to go too many steps straight mm. on from the control. Well, I think it's a bit easier to get up this. Uh, it is. Uh, There's a few branches in the there, way, weren't yeah. there? Yeah. Got to pick your lines. Yeah, whilst there's not too many, you know, there's not very much undergrowth, at least not in this part of the course that we can see, and not in by the other TV split either, then there are quite a lot of brashings, fallen branches and stuff that you just have to, you know, use a little bit of your attention and your focus to kind of make sure you're not falling over every three steps. Simon Hector. Took the third place in the middle distance mm -hmm. at the last World Cup round. They're very surprised uh, third place for him in that race of uh, filled with drama, filled with mistakes. Mm -hmm. He managed to keep it clean. A, a very kind of different um, set of challenges there and compared to here um, where, we, where we haven't seen as many mistakes. Look at Riedefeld here. He was mm. actually able to catch 26 seconds compared to Skade. He's only six seconds, six seconds behind at the pre-warning. So this will be very, very tight here for the, le for the leading position in the finish. Should be there very, very soon. 
Yeah, it's going to be really so tight. Now we'll see him very soon in the picture, I guess. So yeah, Riederfeld here, uh, and he's with a few others who he's caught up as well, which is always helpful, I think, on the uh, on the finish to have a few caught up. Topi Sirilainen and Timo Suter as well. And got to push really, really hard now because, as you can see, there are only seven seconds between Skelet and Riederfeld at the Control 18. That's the last one that's actually in the forest. But it looked like Riederfeld really had a had a fantastic run in and and wasn't really budging. And you can mm -hmm. see actually he's been overtaken by uh, Suter there as well. So maybe not yeah. an indication that he's not going quite as quickly up the run in as maybe as as Skelet. We'll see. It will be tight here, but I don't think it, that he will be fast enough. Let's see, only five seconds to go. So there the time's out for Riedefeld. No, it's not going to be quicker. Skelet is safe, still keeps the leading time. And Riedefeld, yeah, you can see actually him, him having lost time on, the, on this run-in compared to mm -hmm. the Italian. So maybe that that kind of gives of us maybe an indication for some of the later runners that um, that Scalette just was was blindingly quick over the last section, it's but still a very credible second place. 17 seconds down on mm. Scalette shows uh, still a pretty and good it, time. And it gives us also an indication that you actually can win back time there, or you uh, that Scalette lost some time between the control 14 and 18. Mm -hmm. uh, my guess is that it might have been on the long leg between 14 and 15 because we didn't really see any bigger mistakes after that. So now we are with Doug Blanchen. 47, 48 seconds behind here at control 4. That's quite a lot already. At position 23. Yeah, if you are within half a minute at control 14, there's a chance that you can take over the lead in the finish. Yeah, but Dark Blanchard will be outside 30 seconds at control number 6. One of those Norwegians who's raced quite a few World Cups now. He did senior debut at the World Cup in Switzerland in 2019, but not going to get selected for the World Championships, where it's much smaller teams at this point of his career. But such is that great depth of the, the top nations that they can be still uh, competing very, very strongly internationally. Let's have a little look mm -hmm. at the trackings. Yeah, we know that he lost about 47 seconds here in the beginning. See, already a few mm. seconds here towards control one. A few more to control two. It looks kind of consistently here. Yeah, it's not really missing the route to control four either. Must come another small mistake or hesitation here, down here, to control four. Yeah, here he loses quite a lot of time again. Let's say 10 seconds only in the circle. So not the best start for Dark Blanchen. And for me, it looks like he's got good speed on the flat, but not necessarily good speed on the climb looks, or the steeper yeah, parts it of the looks descent. Like a lot of hesitation in. Uh, in the orienteering when he's coming close to the controls and that's not really a good sign here in the beginning because the characteristics of the course won't change a lot. Martin Hoodman though here. Speedily out from the start. 14th in the in Thursday's long distance. Mariana Anderson, I think. Mm. Norway. 
Get a shiver about it. as well. There we go. And he is 33 seconds down. Still in that top 10. But it feels now from here you're going to have to have had a quick start to be able to really feature. Mm, let's see where Shinebari lost those 33 seconds. Uh, maybe something here to control two, only a few seconds. Hesitating here to mm. control three a bit. Exiting the control in a good way. He must have missed that control four, I guess. And down here through the cliffs. No, not really. Losing a bit of time here in the downhill. No uh, visible mistake here, but just losing a bit of time uh, when he gets close to the controls. Right, we can follow Martin Regon in, but he has yeah lost time kind of throughout the whole course, to be honest. Ricardo Scalette still leading all the way around, and maybe, yeah, it's not going to be his day today. With a re after the really great performance on Thursday. Just as you can see, just losing time in small increments throughout. So Martin Leghorn goes into the fourth spot. Two minutes slower than Ricardo Scalette. Still leading there. Max Petterbeimer mm -hmm. was on tenth position in the long distance. 34 seconds behind here at control 4. Also this is a little bit too much. really looking around there mm -hmm. kind of yeah a bit just wanting to get his bearings kind of as you as he goes over that ridge and then obviously you can spot the control very nicely then out up towards the left no problems so yeah looking pretty good through this section but Ah, uh, it's lot, some time lost, 40 seconds lost earlier on. Mm, about half a minute here behind. This is interesting. This is Simon Imark, and he's still going strong here, only 13 seconds behind at control number 12. We also know that Riedefeld was faster than Scalette between control 14 and the pre-warning. So there is a chance here for Imark to be a threat for Scalette. But actually, we haven't seen so many runners uh, running faster than Skalet to the pre-warning. It's basically Albin Riedefeld. <laughs> and here we have Jonas Ahola. Had a quite a good race here. 
throughout the course. A bit more than a minute behind. Could almost match the speed of Skelet from Control 12 to the finish. Yeah, but again, I think losing time between between Control 18 and the end, what's that, mm -hmm. 13 seconds, I think shows you just the, the really quick speed that Skelet had. So even if you're ahead coming out of the forest, you've really got to have a, a uh, enough in your legs left, enough in your lungs to, to race well on that final section. But yeah, pretty uh, solid round there, Luca Bassi. So he actually was caught by the fin. As you can see then down, be about four minutes slower than Skelet. So we'll see soon the likes of Nika Kimmler home, Simon Imark. Here's Martin Hubman, control four. Plus 26 at the moment. Again, you can see him kind mm -hmm. of looking around. You can see many of the runners losing between 25 and 35 seconds in the very beginning and then not losing so much time in the very end of the course. So it's a very decisive part of this race here. Do you think that's because they're maybe using those first few controls to kind of get into it, get into the feeling, get into the map where you saw, and if you contrast that with Skelet, who just was able to attack it really, really hard and just I didn't really feel like he needed to kind of spend that extra time getting into the course? I don't know. I think it's very decisive. There are two parts very decisive on this first part. It's first of all that you don't run around towards control mm -hmm. four and then that you find a good track uh, into control four when you run downhill there because yeah. you see many runners uh, being more or less as fast as Skelet uh, just before control four but then in the slope down to control four through the stony area and the cliffs there then they lose time and i think it's very important that you have a good entrance there to control four and otherwise, on the on the other controls, it's often it's quite good runnability all the way to the control. Uh, mm. So I think this control four there is quite a decisive one. Yeah, I think you're right. You've got to find the good line. You've got to have absolutely no fear in the descent. Mm. I mean, we've got that camera there. We know how steep it is just at that particular point. So that's and particularly you've got to have no fear. Interesting here. Cannot be seen. Still. Going strong here, 51 seconds behind that control 12, that's uh, fourth position. Had a good run also in the long distance, finished ninth there. Has quite a good season actually, was 13th in the, at the World Championships in the middle distance. Yeah, 19th in the long as well, so the 38 year old kind of reaching close to his best orienteering. And a good little section then from 12 to 14, actually catching time there, only 43 seconds down. Really strong. Fleur and Hovald here then. He was eighth uh, on Thursday's long distance, but he's Best individually seems to be his best individual performance seems to come in middle distance races. It seems to suit him uh, a bit more. And this could actually be a terrain that could suit him. Quite stony, um, many features on the map. He's a very technical runner, a strong runner. So I think this could suit him quite well here. We 
waiting for Doug Blanchen. He was 44 seconds behind at control 6. Kind of walking. Is it? I don't think that's Doug Blanchen. I think. No. I think that might be him further back. No, completely miss it now. <laughs> well, it is a gorgeous forest to look at, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Even if we can't currently see any runners on it, there's I'm not somebody. Sure, I don't think it's Doug Bounchan. No, it isn't. So we give up yep. waiting for Doug Blanchin. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have a look at Amos Spensk instead. He was uh, on his way out of the start and now we are really kind of getting into our top runners here. Although Amos Svensk didn't have as great a uh, long distance on Thursday. He was though fifth in the long distance of the world champs and 10th in the middle distance. And we'll be looking to, go that to put together mm -hmm. a good race. We've also had Adam Heimdall has also gone off. He was fourth uh, in the long distance on Thursday as well. Really good from him. Yeah, and now we found him, Dark Blanchen here in the picture. Also found Eskil Shinneberi just behind. So Eskil Shinneberi has caught Dark Blanchen up by two minutes, but you can see Shinneberi is also a minute and 33 behind. So. Dag Blanchen, 1 minute 33, you would say, behind. And Eskil Shinneberry, after a good start, has dropped. Yeah, lost a minute there. It'll be good to see on the tracking. I'm sure we will get a chance to have a look. We'll follow him now to the 14th control. Just hesitating there. Mm. Should have very much better kind of hits that path and goes straight on up. And you can you can spot the top of the hill as you can see there from, from quite a long way away. You just have to kind of point yourself in that direction and get up to the top of the hill, which they both mm. done. I hope we will stay we'll here leg. at control between control twelve and fourteen because we are very soon we'll see Simon Hector punched at control 12, so they are 42 seconds behind on position 4, here we have him. So that's a good race here, a Swedish runner. Yeah, not lost that much time between uh, 6 and 12. Yeah, and we know that there is, poten there is the potential to catch a few seconds mm -hmm. between control 14 and 18. Maybe not 42 seconds, been, but still, yeah. A lot of people have actually been catching time between 12 and 14 as well. Yeah. Um, just catching just a few seconds. So there's an opportunity to catch theirs. It's what we've just seen um, Eskil Shinneberry do, catch a few seconds up there. So it wasn't a clean one. It just shows, yeah, it wasn't a clean one from Skelet. And you can, there is the opportunity for runners to make an impact there. So he was 42 seconds behind. Let's see, just checking the, maybe the routes there on his way up to 14th. Mm -hmm. And I say that he's actually lost time. <laughs> 
Yeah, and you see now we will switch to Florian Hovald here. He was only three seconds behind at control four on his way up the hill towards control six now. So this is a very good start by Florian Hovald. Yeah, really attacking start, though we've not seen that many people walk up that section of the hill, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But as long yeah, as you kind of come around that boulder. Yeah, as long as you use the time when you're walking to read the map, um, it's more okay to do it. But you see that he lost seven seconds here in that section. Ten seconds behind still, that's a good start. Yeah, so some good speed, but some hesitations in there as well. From one uh, Swiss to another, Daniel Hubman. And now we're really getting, of course, to the sharp end. Daniel Hubman currently third in the uh, World Cup standings and third place in yesterday's long distance race as well so he's certainly got the the tools to be able to put together a fantastic uh, middle distance where we would expect Casper Foster to be not quite as dominant as he has been in the uh, in the long distance races of recent times mm -hmm. but Simon Imark then here through to the last section but well, you said there is an opportunity to make up some time from controls 14 to 18. There's also an opportunity but to lose a lot of yeah, time, and I that's wonder, exactly what he's done. I wonder if he did the small mistake, because you can't see him. He's not really pushing that hard. Of course, he's pushing hard, but you can, uh, if you compare his body language to the one that Ricardo Scaletta had before, you could see that he really was fighting for, a race, for the race of his life, and uh, you don't really have the same feeling for Simon Imark. But still, it's a good run. It'll be interesting to see if he lost some time there. If he did a small mistake between 14 and 18. But you can also see that he only lost 7 seconds here between 18 and finish. So it's... Oh, and then he is having the head <laughs> at the place he wouldn't want to have the head, actually. Yeah. Well spotted. Yeah, <laughs> no, maybe someone needs to tell him that. It's kind um. of a shitty place there. <laughs> Right, we have um, Matthias Kubert here at the start. He is the second to last starter. And there is the opportunity for him to, I guess, take a new... He, he's still mathematically possible for him to be able to win the World Cup and take another World Cup um, overall title um, in his career. But Kasper Fosser with a big lead, so... But there's still all to play for. You've got to be in it to win it. And he's going to certainly give that a good chance after his second place in the long distance. He is, of course, also the yeah. middle world champion. And <laughs> talking about uh, a champion, this start here was really, really strong by Emil Svensk. We have often seen that from him, that he has sections in the course where he is really strong. Uh, for example, the long distance at the World Championships, he really messed up the first half of the course, but he was the fastest runner on the second half. Um, for him, the challenge often is to get it right throughout the whole course. There's often one control where he is missing a losing a lot of time. So let's see if he can have a more consistent race today. But he has definitely the speed to, to be very fast in this race here. That's a really, really good start here. Yeah, fantastic start then. 13 seconds is the gap and he's the first one to go quicker. Then Ricardo Scalette, who still is our leader at the finish. So that's really, really significant there. The first one to go quicker. Mm, interesting here. I'm seeing also he was faster between 14 and 18. 13 seconds compared to Ricardo Scalette. Um, very good race here by Gennad Imsin. So I think he is fighting for a third position. The gap between... Skelet and Riedefeld, 17 seconds. Let's see, maybe there's a chance to be on second position here. Yeah, he's fighting really hard, pushing really hard and backing up a great long distance result 
with another great run here in this terrain. Evidently suits him really well. He's got a lot of confidence. But now he's going to fight really hard, cheered on by his Austrian teammates. And you can see he just kind of, he brings it up a gear then, doesn't he? <laughs> he's really going to go going out and uh, just stepping it up to get all the way into the finish. And it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be into a solid third place there. So 35 seconds behind Ricardo Scalette. Yeah, as you said, dropping, dropping five seconds on that last bit, but that's pretty, pretty good there, I think. And we just see Casper Fosser, the final starter. New king of the long distance, long distance world champion. And he nearly runs the wrong way out of the start. Uh, he, <laughs> That's he was not, running it's towards. not a good start, is no, it? No, but he was running towards the, the start flag. He, actually, you have to mm. pass the starting flag. So it's kind of a definition, uh, yeah, a uh, matter of definition, how close you have to be to the mm. starting flag. But uh, he was very distinct uh, have it heading towards the distinctively have it heading towards the starting flag there. Yeah. I don't think he was about to go on the wrong direction <laughs> actually. No. He was just making making his way very directly there. Joey Haddon then. Plus twenty two seconds. So in fifth spot. Certainly made a better start to this course than he did the long distance. If I don't know if you've, and if you've seen the GPS tracking, but there was a big mistake from him to control number one. I think he finished in 72nd place, exactly 34 minutes slower than Casper Fosser on that long distance. I would imagine once you'd made such a howler as he did in number one, then he's not going to go full gas around the rest of the course like that. So, um, but it was a shame to see Joey Haddon, who we've seen, well, you know, we've seen him take wins multiple wins recently on the World Cup circuit in the middle distance race, including in Sweden, the last round. So we know he's got great middle distance form, particularly uh, when it all goes right. I know he was, yeah, particularly glad to back up that that win that he, his first World Cup win was in Switzerland, his second one in Sweden, just kind of showing that you can do it across that Scandinavian terrain as well. But let's have a look. Daniel Hoodman, though, has actually had a better start than Joey had on. Mm. 16 seconds behind at control four. It's a fourth position. So interesting talking about Hoopman, Martin Hoopman at control 14, only 35 seconds behind. So he was able to actually run faster from control 6 to control 14 but back to Daniel Hoopman here you can see just he's how carefully he's reading the map as we were talking on the kind of the entrance to that control No hesitations, and actually staying very high up in the line there. Matthias Kibbutz, you can see just how well, how much he's looking to the to his right to get this. We must mm. be on the way to control number four. Is he coming from the way around here? Then I guess that he lost I some think time. He has. Yeah, I think he's gone around on the path. It would be a very Kibbutz thing to do. Mm. <laughs> Kibbutz esque to yes. go around there. Let's see the time. 24 yeah, seconds 24. behind, I think. Well, we were saying, weren't we? It was about 20, 25 yeah. seconds, I think, slower to go around that that bit than just the direction he's approaching well, I mean, control. Yeah. yeah, compared to many of the other runners going around, the gap isn't too big. But still, it's 24 seconds. Of course, that's a big disadvantage for the... Controls no, but when you're racing for the okay. win, then 24 seconds on a, on a middle distance is, yeah. It's quite a lot, but um, mm. yeah, I mean, a lot of things have to happen if he, for him to be able to win the overall World Cup, I think he was more eager to save the second position here. There's only 14 points between him and Daniel Hoopman, but it's 
77 points between Foster and Kibbutz, so it actually has, I think uh, Foster has to be outside top 20 and Kibbutz has to win. And uh, to even have a chance to win it, he has to be the winner or end up in second position here. Yeah, so we'll all attempt to do some quick maths. Although it's, it, if if Casper Fossa wins it, then we don't need to bother with yeah. the maths. It's quite easy. But uh, I mean, if he's he... within top twenty, we don't have to do any math. So it's uh... <laughs> that's true. Well, Casper Fossa has. Um, Looks like he took the straight route through to that control, to control number four, which looks to be good. But he's still 16 seconds down. Emil Svenskben still with a great start at that point, but it looks very quick through to the controls. And we'll soon see him kind of coming up over the ridge. There we go. Mm -hmm. Kind of see where others have made those lines in there, straight out and straight up. And what I think I noticed, Casper Fossa had such a great downhill speed as well on that long distance. I think he, the long, the really really long leg. I think it was control number 19. He was running like four minutes, four twelve minutes per kilometer on that leg. Everybody else. Uh, about 4.43, 4.45 is the next quickest ones in that leg. And I mean, just that downhill speed on that. The, there's just the <laughs> meters and meters of downhill on that big long leg. Just, I think, showed you his strength there. So still those 16 seconds down. Equal time then to Daniel Hubman. But certainly not out of it after that start. Still in contention. That's Simon Hector into fifth position, 114 behind. Another good race by the Swedish runner, who was the surprise in Idre. Now he had another good race here. Yeah, looking from the splits, just kind of losing a few seconds every single time, but nothing too dangerous or too damaging there. As we take another look at those our results now, of course, we have everybody now through split number one. Uh, we'll soon have everybody through split number two as well. And this race is just thick and fast and furious because, of course, we've got some. Um, it's it's very quick. We're gonna we're already under the expected winning time. Mm. And Florian Hovald here is also late. Yeah, but he's still within those thirty seconds. Uh, we said that it's yeah very have a chance to be a threat for. Ricardo Scalet, because he was losing time between 14 and 18. Oh, a little bit of hesitating here. 35 seconds. Yeah. And Might we also know Scalet here. wasn't particularly quick between 12 and 14, so. Mm -hmm. Max Petabema, though, into the finish. And he is going to be, yeah, lost, lost a bit of time on the last section as well. Just kind of increments of time throughout. And looks like he's just going to make it, make it inside the top ten so far. Max Petter-Bamer from Sweden plodded into the finish where he will go into mm -hmm. eighth spot then. And soon we and are waiting. Run in as soon well. We, yeah, soon we are waiting for Svensk, Emil Svensk to control 12. But here we are with Auden Heimdahl. Oh, 
Now done Heimdall with the uh, fourth place in the long distance. He's also a really good ski orienteer as well. A 24 year old. Made the final of the European Champs knockout sprint. And I think one of those names to watch out for as they progress in the senior side of things really made some good improvement over the pandemic and to be having a, a really good season 2021. Yeah, and had a good section then just just at 12 to 14, catching up a few seconds. And not too much hesitation on the way th then out of that control for this long leg. Mm, and here we have Emil Svensk. Now he lost ah. time. He's 31 seconds behind at control 12. And he is looking around. Yeah, it doesn't look too smooth. It's a bit what we were talking about before that he mm. if you just look at some sections isolated in a course he can be really quick but often at one point in the race he loses a lot of time or in this case I mean a lot of time 45 seconds is quite a lot of time in the middle distance yeah and that was even before those hesitations into control mm -hmm. 13 that we just saw so yeah Still, we have Ricardo Scalet in the lead. <laughs> and there are not many runners to come. It can no. actually be a threat for him. We have Hoopman, we have Fosse, we have Hadorn, Kiburts, and maybe Hovald. And I think the others, they have lost too much. Yeah, and here's another hesita hesitation. Ah, that doesn't look too good here in this section. No, he's found the top of the hill now looking. You can see the refolding of the map just to get through to the next section, the next leg. But yeah. Then we know Honestly, also I'm that quite surprised he's not lost more time. Yeah, but we also know that it wasn't Scalette's best part either. That's true. We have uh, Martin Hoopman. Hoopman. Fourth place Fourth then, position, yeah. Quite a consistent race. He was already 38 seconds behind at control four. So from there he actually lo only lost 11 seconds to the finish. Yeah, I think that just shows you how, um, I think maybe how impressive Ricardo Scalette's start yeah. of the course was particularly a lot of been able to keep pace with him around the second part of the course but he just managed to take so much time out of people in that first section and uh Hadorn is you know similar time down compared yeah. to Emil Svensk here but looking much better through this particular section anyway we have seen so many runners here between control 12 and 14 that have had between 30 and 40 seconds uh disadvantage compared to Ricardo Scalette. So it was really this first section, the very beginning of the course, that was decisive so far. important now for Hadorn to win a few seconds back here to control 14. Looks good for him. Uh, let's see here. Has to go on the very top of the hill, <laughs> yes. It looked good to think in the he beginning. He was winning seconds back and then he's no yeah, lost Yeah, but he won again. seconds back, that's the thing. Yeah. He would have been he, like yeah. won at least 10 seconds back, but no. He's kind of getting ahead of himself, I think, uh, or not quite realizing the controls right at the top of the hill. Yeah, then dropping down quite a lot then 
Ooh, going into control 15. Maybe he's going to head so towards the path. We are waiting for Hoopman. Daniel Hoopman. So back into the top three then. And Hoopman has also lost time. 45 seconds down. I want to know where mm -hmm. all these guys are losing time here. And he's kind of just being very careful on the way up. Be no problem with this one, but just doesn't seem to be quite well. Uh, quite, you know, he he's taking a lot of pauses on the hills. I guess obviously, as we said before, that when when you're climbing the hills is where you do want to take your pauses if you're gonna if you're gonna take them where you want to read the map and everything. But I wonder if that just means he's kind of losing a couple of seconds here and there. But he does look much better through that section. Definitely compare if you compare to Amos Fensk. And as long as he doesn't make a faff at the top of this hill, he'll be look better than Joey Hadorn as well. Look, put C1 in Mark's uh, result uh, position into good stead there as well. Mm -hmm. He is fifth. You know, he lost a lot of time towards the latter stages, so he's currently fifth at the finish. Talking about runners who look better than others, here it looks really good for Matthias Kiburts. He turned around this Oof. race so far and now he's in the lead. Nine seconds ahead of Ricardo Scalet. Ten seconds even. At control 12. So he must have had a really good section here between control 6 and 12. Yeah, he's the first one to go faster than Scalet at control number 12. At our pre-warning for this TV control. And that is really decisive, although it looks like... He doesn't want to drop too much height there, just trying to be careful on this section. Pick up this path, and then you can spot the top of the hill from here and make your way up, I think. He's looking around a lot, maybe thinking about... I Well, I hope he's thinking about the Control 15 rather than this one. Yeah, there we go, he spotted it. Not quite as distinct for me on that control, to be honest, mm -hmm. but he does go still into a new leading time. Yeah, Have and talking about leading up. times, um, because oh. now other things are happening. I think <laughs> we'll see it very soon in the picture. We have a new yeah, leader at got... control 12. Yeah, we've only got one more runner to come through this control 12. It is, of course, Casper Fosser, Ricardo Scalette. It's all uh, sitting looking very happy underneath that mask. He's got his fingers crossed. Maybe he's hoping for a Hannah Lundberg moment. Um, <laughs> you never know. But here he is. Here's the final starter. Here is Casper Fosser. And look at that, 34 seconds quicker than Matthias Kibbert, who already was 10 seconds quicker than Ricardo Scalette at that point at control number 12. So it's looking really, really good for Casper Fosser to take two out of two here and cement mm. his uh, first ever World Cup title on his first full season as a senior, of course. And look at the speed he has uphill here. Oh. It's really something special. Now it's, look at this here, just How one 21 take, seconds. How can uh, you take 21 seconds out of I mean, we've, on that time? We've oh. seen other runners winning around 10 seconds compared to Scalet. We saw that Kibbutz lost uh, 22 seconds, no, let's see now, he was 10 seconds ahead, yeah, he lost a few seconds compared to Scalet, so he, it wasn't Kibbutz's best action there, but still, it was very strong by Kasper Foster, <laughs> now leading by almost one minute here. That's really impressive, a whole minute with only 19 minutes, 38 seconds run, that is really, really good. Uh, star intention from Kasper Fosser. We'll look at Florian Hovald now, and he has got much closer then to uh, Skelet, and we know there's the chance to, to catch up time, although actually now we're looking at compared to 
Oh, forget that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because obviously his early ones now compared but to But he got Kasper closer. Foster. He did he get closer. closer, there we yeah. go. So, but it, it looks like, yeah, he's definitely going to be outside the top two, maybe even the top three by the time he comes through to the finish. Florian Herwald working hard here. It's going to be slower than Gernot Insane, though. And the Swiss cowbells are out. He will go into fourth place, I think. Just ahead of Martin Hoodman. There we go. Yep, into fourth place. And now we have some shaky moments for Ricardo Scalet waiting here. There's Hoopman out there, there's Svensk out there, Hadorn, <laughs> Kibbutz and Fosser, and he's still in the lead. Right on cue. Oh, yeah. Oh, need to be in my Italy strip. There we go. Uh, and we'll now see uh, Alden Heimdall into the finish. But he's not but a he's threat. Yeah, no. He is too far down at this point. But still, again, it's a good race by Odin Heimdall. He was fourth in the long distance. And here another good race by the Norwegian. Yeah, and I think that's real mark of a a successful season where you've got that type of consistency really across the World Cup circuit that maybe will turn into multiple kind of top 20s, top 10s, then you've really got to be happy with that. So behind Alden Heimdall we have Eamon Svensk, Joey Haddon, Daniel Hubman, Matthias Kibbertz and Kasper Fosser. So five runners after the Norwegian to come through, but one really flying Norwegian, the last starter, who has really mm -hmm. put his mark on this competition. But and we'll have that's... so much confidence after the three and a half minute lead. Yeah, no, I three think and a half that... minute lead, five and a half minute lead. Mm -hmm. I think that Svensk is a bit late at the last radio control don't have to punch there yet started two minutes behind Odin Heimdall and he was uh, 35 seconds behind Ricardo Scalet at control 14 so sixth place then for the Norwegian five runners yet to finish I think Svensk is late, so the next one we are waiting for them to be a threat, might be a threat, so we had on. Yeah, we, we still haven't seen Emma Svensk and we're still waiting for Joe Haddon. I haven't seen his time coming up or if it has, it's gone dropped a long way down mm, let's see if we can spot someone there is it the swedish kit i would go with yes yes it looks blue ish but he is late emil svensk lost about a minute there another no one and a half minutes he's now two minutes and 14 behind Position 17. Yeah, I can only think there must be a mistake there. Well, we saw how uh, how much time he kind of dropped between uh, 12 and 14, those hesitations. He actually still is, you know, he's the quickest to controls four and six. Yeah, then it kind of seems to go wrong from there. And I think it comes back to what you've been saying all along, like has some really good start to races, can go mm -hmm. really well, but it can, can quite often lose a lot of time. Svensk is 2 minutes and 14 seconds behind, 2 minutes behind Svensk, we had Joey Haddon starting, so also he is late, otherwise he would yep. be together here with Emil Svensk. So this yeah. 
<laughs> it, then it's only Hoopman, Kibbutz, and Fosser who can be a threat for Ricardo Scalet. And then once, yeah, once we have Daniel Hoopman through, who I also think is late as well now. Um, uh, he's still a then, chance, I guess. Then is, then is a medal for Skelet. What a turn up for the books. No, I think Daniel Hoopman's late now as well. I want to get a wider shot of seeing who's coming in <laughs> behind Sense now. Now we have Hadon punching there. Two minutes and 18 seconds behind on 19th position. So he's behind Svensk. Yeah, we can see, yeah, we can see him just coming through there, maybe I think, in the background. But yeah, Svensk from leading at controls four and control six. Just the time ticking by now for Swede. And he will finish, though, in 17th spot. Disappointing when you've been so good right at the beginning part of the course. It's tricky. So we also are looking now for uh, Joey Hadorn will be in very soon. We've had the pre-warning, though, for Daniel Hubman. And, and we're waiting for Kibbutz. Yeah, we are waiting for Kibbutz. To see if he he's going to take. That's Hadorn, I guess, if you look at the yep. running style. And, and then I think we have the punch. And then I think no. behind we have Daniel Hubman. Yeah, and we also have the punch at control 18. Matthias Kiburts is 28 seconds ahead of Ricardo Scalet. But Daniel Hubman is just under a minute down on Ricardo Scalet. So I think this is going to be. A medal for the Italian. What an amazing achievement for Riccardo Scala. Everything seems to be coming together. We will talk these Swiss runners into the finish and we will start thinking about the uh, World Cup overall as we've also had the punch now from Casper Fosser, the last control mm -hmm. of the forest. So we'll soon see them all kind of processing in. Joey had on here really fighting really hard all the way on this line, but uh, Joey Haddon is too far behind now, and now we compare Daniel Hubman. Now we are comparing him to the times of Casper Foster, who we've seen punch at this uh, at that 18th control, really working hard to get this. We can see he's already slower than Skelet, and we've still got this last long run in to go. 240 meters from the last control to the finish line. Uh, Haddon into 16th then. We're looking for Daniel Hubman. We're looking for Matthias Kibbert and we are looking for Casper Fosser. So Daniel Hubman here, he's also going to be outside the top three, outside the medals today, even when he finishes with Kibbert and Fosser to go. So we can say there is a medal for, and there is a third place for Ricardo Scalet. What a fantastic run from the Italian. When you get someone starting that, Early and posting a quick time, you're never really quite sure how it's going to stack up. Daniel Hoodman will go just slower than his younger brother into six spots, 53 seconds behind. But we are waiting for the flying Norwegian to come through very soon. Matthias Kibbert will go quicker than Daniel Hoodman, which means he will maintain his spot as second in the World Cup overall. But you can see the Norwegian there in the right of picture. He is closing down on Matthias Kibbutz. Kibbutz will go quicker than Skelet here. And he looks like after a kind of a tricky start, he managed to catch up some time on the Italian. He will go take the new lead here, but it's going to be a short-lived lead, 32-0-1. As very soon, we're going to look and see Casper Fosser chasing down Matthias Kiewert, here he is. Here's the final starter. He was leading the World Cup standings going into this race, having won all the long distances on this World Cup circuit. And he is going to back that up with a win here in the last individual race of the season. Casper Foster, 
What a season. And his first full season as a senior has been so incredible in the forest. And he will take the clear, clear win today. 30 minutes, 37 seconds. One minute 24 quicker than Matthias Kibbert. And just that speed. Look at that smile on Casper Foster's face. And he's managed to take the overall World Cup win in 2021. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he won't be too surprised about winning the World Cup after uh, after the long distance race and the big gap we had uh, before the race here, but he's just showing uh, another time here how good he is, how good his shape is, and he's just dominating the World Cup this year. I mean, uh, you could read both Mat uh, Matthias Kivurz and Daniel Hoopman's statements uh, after the long distance and they said both that they had uh, technically and physically good mm -hmm. races so and still he won by five and a half minutes and today he is winning by one minute and 24 uh, in front of Kibur who had a good race as well I mean he's may might have taken a bad route choice to the fourth control but otherwise uh, seemed to be quite a good race and then the big surprise on the third position Ricardo oh. Scalette uh, with the medal here um, you said that we might have to do some calculations here they made it very easy for us because they <laughs> had more or less the order of the World Cup uh, uh, into the finish here. Kasper Fosser uh, was in the lead and then Kibbutz in second place and Hoopman beating Hado and Hado beating Svensk. So it was not really something to calculate here. We have the top three Fosser, Kibbutz and Hoopman also in the overall World Cup. Um, yeah, it was a fun race, even though we had a lot of action in the very end and uh, a leader <laughs> leading for a long time throughout the race before Ricardo Scalette. Uh, yeah, he followed us always the whole broadcast time here from the top and then the last 30 seconds we had two new leaders. The only time <laughs> in the race more or less. Yeah, well, that's what happens when someone kind of puts in an outstanding performance as well. We've also got, um, I want to shout out Gernot Insane for the fifth place there for the 38-year-old. Uh, really strong performance, kind of kind of getting back to what was his best earlier in his career. And we had uh, Alden, Alden Heimdall also, again, another top 10, ninth spot for him. Simon Imark. 10th, Simon Hector 11th. That's really great uh, news for some of those uh, Swedish runners who wouldn't necessarily always get first picks at, say, like world champs um, there. And so here we can see confirmation then of those standings or the, the, the final standings probably for the uh, World Cup overall. Kasper Fosser, 460 points then overall. And I think we will hear from him now. Foster, today's winner and the winner of the World Cup 2021. How does it feel? Uh, it feels amazing. Uh, it's uh, really fun to finally do a solid middle, middle distance uh, this year. I, I feel like it's been my weak point this year that I, I've often not quite reached my percent potential in the middle, but today everything went as planned and uh, yeah, I'm just really, really happy about this race. Yeah, you didn't do any mistake today? No, not at all. I, uh, Perfect race. Yeah, no, I, I didn't feel like I uh, did any mistakes at all. It was uh, almost the perfect race for me. <laughs> you have had a fantastic season this year. Can you give us a highlight? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's been amazing, racing, especially world champs winning, winning the long distance there. It's uh, it's uh, yeah, this uh, season has become more than I have uh, had there to dream dream of, and uh, and uh, yeah, I feel like. Uh, I feel like I've taken uh, a big step this year towards my my uh, end goal to be or to be able to call myself the best orienteer in the world. That's that's a dream, and uh, this year I've uh, I really taken some big steps, and that's super fun. Yeah, thank you very much, Kasper, and congratulations. Thank you. Well, his uh, first senior season was delayed a bit by the pandemic, but it was worth the wait because he has been so great. I mean, just looking at this World Cup result, the World Champs results, his worst race was a fifth in the middle distance. And he, I mean, he talks about not, not quite having perfect middle distance runs this year. And uh, when, when that one was a fifth, I mean, yeah. Talking about the end goal to be the best orienteer in the world, I just say congratulations. Uh, you are <laughs> the best orienteer in the world at the moment. 
at the moment, but there is something about having the longevity, you know, that we've seen <laughs> from people. That's what they're really after. But anyway, we will pause that conversation because we will talk about longevity in, in orienteering in the top of the world very soon. I'm sure we will, but let's have a look at the, the women's map then. Yeah, it's kind of the uh, similar characteristics of the course. We have those um, short legs, many of them uh, a bit in group, two or three controls together and then a longer leg. Many changes in direction here, as we have seen in the men's course before and then also in the women's race. Um, those two TV controls in the women's race is between control 3 and 5 and 8 and 10 and then the long leg quite similar to the men's course between 10 and 11 which was quite decisive we could see I mean it wasn't really decisive towards the result but we could see that for example Scalette lost a lot of time compared to a few runners if you really uh, were able to find the fastest track there the fastest line towards control 13 and then also here we have this finish on the open fields uh, quite a long running leg here from 15 to 16 17 and then to the finish and you see the course has uh, only 17 controls not 20 compared to the men's race so it's a bit shorter also kilometer wise but I think, um, yeah, let's see if the course here, if the course planner was able to really find those 35 minutes or if it's a faster race, even in the women's race here. Yeah, my thought is it will be. We'll look through the, um, the latter end of the start list now. Um, again, the... All the, the start list is defined by the World Cup standings. So, of course, we do have Tova Alexanderson going off last. Simona Abersold, um, second to last. Hannah Lundberg is currently third in the standings. And, I mean, really, look at those, particularly those top five women. Uh, that's really where we're going to see the battles. But then, you know, Tova Alexanderson, so dominant at the World Championships. Um, not, didn't have a very good time for her very high standards in um, Sweden, but she's still uh, winning the, uh, leading the standings. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's very tight here. We only have a difference of five points between two Alexanderson and Simone Abersol. So basically it's the one uh, beating the other here to win the overall World Cup, at least if one of them is within the top five, which historically uh, i mean the chance for that is very big <laughs> <laughs> okay so as we saw we have isia basse a current leader at the finish sitting in that leader's chair 3709 so not quite gone as quick yet but obviously we've got uh, i'd say there's probably fewer surprises in the women's class earlier on compared to the men so i'd expect that time to come definitely down under those 35 minutes Maybe it'll get close to the 30 like it did in the men's. Anyway, our current leader at controls... Oh, and I have to change my, my head around of which controls it is. Controls three to five is actually Megan Carter-Davis, who's gone through those uh, the fastest, quicker than Isia Basse. But Emma Biesmo is just 23 seconds down uh, on Carter-Davis. So she is in was in second place at control uh, number three. So again, this is uh, the section that we've seen quite a lot. And I am i don't think I'm that surprised to see Megan Carter-Davis taking uh, that good early start. She's a very strong runner and um, did really well in the um, long distance race. I think it was a 12th spot for her. Yep, and of course she was on the podium in the long distance uh, at the uh, World Champs. Sixth place for her, so Good start for her and Emma Biesmo hasn't, she was 24th in the long distance. And losing a few seconds to Carter Davis on that particular point. Of course, we'll see them, these are common controls compared to the men, so we'll see them go through that same section. So is Anna Shikova, then for the Czech Republic, had a first top 10 at a World Cup. Ninth spot for her. 
She was also a finalist in the European Champs uh, knockout sprint. Made her first uh, starts at, in the forest in the World Champs this year, previously having run sprints. Mm -hmm. And she, she too, similar time to Emma Biesmo then. Mm -hmm. She recently moved to Finland for studying. It's so kind of a change in the training setting there for Janusikova. Be, would be interesting to see if uh, how the root choice to control three here in the women's r race if it's uh, if you lose time as well if you're running around or if it's maybe uh, bet the better option here in the women's race compared to the men's race you know that uh, it lost about 10 to 15 seconds if you ran around on the path or the street to control four it was in the men's race but of course there are differences between the uh, women's and men's races i mean it's uh, even if it's kind of the same control it's sometimes it's a bit faster going straight for it in the men's class compared to the women's class or the other way around could be as well depends a bit on the course planning so Yanashikova just losing a few seconds there compared to Biesmo. And compared to Carter Davis, who's still leading at this point. Just maybe some small hesitations going up and over that ridge into control number four. Here's Lena Strand. Mm -hmm. She seems to have been running around there. Lost quite a lot of time here. Start section. 41 seconds. So she's in position seven. Yeah, she's not had the best um, 2021. She was 40th in the long distance on Thursday. Was uh, ran the sprints at the World Champs, I believe. Uh, but is the has a long silver medal from the uh, World Champs in Norway back in 2019. working hard today. It may be interesting to say at this point that we've not got uh, a couple of the top Swiss runners here on the women's side. We've not got Spin Hausfit, we've not got Eleanor Ross, neither of them mm -hmm. uh, part of this team. I know Sabina Hausfit said she's not, I think she's not feeling very fit at this part of the season so she didn't feel like she was able to compete at the high standard that she normally is at and I think I think she's had a slightly subpar season for again her very very high standards so um, it'll be really interesting to see how you know maybe with the absence of those how some of the others the Swiss runners are able to step up and how the others are able to go but here is mm -hmm. Megan Carter Davis then and she is still leading, leading controls three and five, and it has extended her lead at control number eight. And we're seeing her now on the way through to control number 10. Looks to be very solid here. She does a lot of training up in the Welsh Hills. And that's put her, I think, given her some really good um, hill climbing strength that showed in the Czech Republic and is gonna show here today. And I know definitely in the Czech Republic, she she very much had it in her head that she wasn't going to move from the control until she'd got the whole route to the next one. Because if you moved one step in one direction, it might uh, bias you to, to going that particular way. And actually, then you end up losing more time. So I wonder if that's kind of she's em employing those same tactics for the longer legs uh, in today's race. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's very important that you said for the longer legs because on the on the short legs it's basically uh, straight on and you can see it quite yeah. easily. So it's uh, it's okay that we saw her doing it at control ten. It would not have been a good sign in almost <laughs> any of the other controls there. But I mean, uh, the, she has quite a big lead here, so uh, many things she's doing right today. Yeah, I would be a bit worried if she was going to do that every single time. My goodness me, Maria Olausen, plus 1340. 
Oh no, I kind of want to see what's happened now because that is, a, a, wow, it's not her day today at all. After her 15th place yesterday and she was, um, you know, part of that bronze medal uh, winning relay team, uh, the world champs, seventh in the long distance. She had has been having, at least at the world, uh, the world champs had a great season, but mm. oof, that's painful. She had an 11th place in the middle distance as well. Mm -hmm. Something must have happened here. Hope we will see it in the GPS replay. Something must have happened at the beginning as well to be 3 minutes and 11 seconds down too. That's a long way. Such a shame for the Norwegian who can be so, so quick. Yeah, but uh, yeah, another Norwegian not very quick here. Yeah, Victoria Heistad Bjornstad, yes. you can see he's at the top there. And I think that's Paula Gross at the bottom who's overtaken her. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. You can kind so of see as you look on that slope, you can yeah, see some of the good routes down towards the right. Yeah, but what is she doing up there? Oh, no, she's coming down. There she is. Doesn't look very confident here. No, you're too up high in the hill here. I don't now know what she, she is afraid what she's of. Looking, she's looking ahead because she can see Paula Gross has run off. Yeah, but I so don't now know what she's afraid of. Distracted. Uh, when running, she must think sh that she's too much to the left. Well, I, I don't really get it what she thinks she's doing. She must have lost control over the situation totally because coming from yeah. up there, you can't really be too much to the left because then you would have a big cliff in front of you. Yeah, that's tricky, but it feels like you've you've not got it because you're not you're kind of halfway up the slope that control is. You kind of it looks like maybe it's near towards the bottom of the slope, but it's halfway up, so maybe she doesn't want to go too far down. But I think the fact that she's just seen Paula Gross running off from that control, mm. having punched it, that is a big, you know, yeah, but a distraction. But I think, but Paula. But Gross the fact is that she is okay. relying so much on Paula Gross shows oh, me yeah. that she doesn't really have uh, control over the situation. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, we just saw Karen Olsen start there, but back with Paolo Gross, who still is behind that time of Megan Carter Davis. And for me, she's again not in control here. She's really got her head in her map quite a lot and just not being distinct. At this point, losing more seconds here. This is the one where you've you've got to head up. You've got to go between the two hills and make your way to the control. But yeah, losing, you know what? Yeah, like 25 seconds in that short section is not a good idea. This is Vera Klemetinen. Who's caught some time on Megan Carter Davis in the middle of the course? But actually, is dropping back a bit more now compared to the Brit on this leg. And this climb up to the 10th control. I think we had uh, Victoria Estabjörnsnade there. there. She punched the control four minutes behind. And um, which means that's Lotte Kohola then as well, yeah. who's caught up. There she is. There's a good start mm. for Carola on the second position here. Shared second yeah. position. That's pretty good. And yeah, she was 10th in the uh, long distance race. And here's Natalia Gempela, who took third on Thursday in the long distance. 
She is a former middle distance world champion and will be looking to race this one really hard. And we have got uh, Serena Kibbert here, who also had a fantastic run, mm -hmm. sixth place for her. Yeah, she had a really distance. good run and mm. was really satisfied with it. She had a quite a good run at the World Championships as well, if you remember that. But she punched the man's control there in the middle, which was very close. She was not the only one. I think Jana Knapova punched it as well, did a mispunch mm. there. Yeah, that was pretty brutal to see that coming up on the GPS, to be honest, well, especially when you're having such a good run, you know. Mm. But 44 seconds behind at this point and just... I think a few kind of small stops to look at the maps and small hesitations into this control itself. Look quickly, you can see how much she's looking up ahead to get the line out, out of this uh, control, this short one. As you said, maybe, maybe it's worth looking, uh, discussing again the the kind of flow and, and the rhythm of this course that actually makes it a little bit easier for the athletes? Yeah, I mean, uh, we talked about it before when you saw the map of the course. It's very obvious that you have many times you have these groups of control, two or three controls, and many of the controls have kind of the same distance in between. Of course, you have a change of direction, but it's very convenient for you as a runner if you have the same distance between the controls because then you have kind of the feeling for for it it's not that we have a big change in runnability here throughout the course so that doesn't really make a difference for the runners so often you can adapt to the distance between the controls and get a good feeling for it and it gives you the possibility to build up a good flow uh, but we have to be careful changed when changing the direction and then also to adapt when you have these longer controls in this race here basically control 3 and 11 but otherwise it's well uh, i mean you <laughs> yeah you could have put one or two controls in with kind of a different distance in between but uh, we have seen mistakes in the men's race, we have seen mistakes so far in the women's race, so I think it's a good course for the World Cup race. Um, but it allows the runner to adapt the rhythm kind of to the to the course you, you got from the course planner. Yep, so we're looking now here, Susan Lersch is going to be one of the first to be close to Isia Basse. We have not seen much from the finish at all, uh, such as Isia Basse's... Um, uh, kind of great time that she set earlier on, but she has caught up a um, couple of minutes there and she's going to be looking to go into a strong second place here. I think she's going to be just out of uh, taking a new leading time. But in fact, Susan Lush has, has caught up a lot from control uh, the control 10 onwards. For she was two minutes down there, so maybe a, a reflection of Isia Basse making some mistakes there. But Susan Lush will go into second place here. German athlete. Isia Basse still with that leading time. We've got uh, a lot, though, to come through to the, the next part to the second split first, and then we'll see a lot at the finish. Sarah Hagstrom, though, has made a fantastic start. Is the first to go quicker than Carter Davis here. And quicker mm. by 14 seconds as well. Good speed in the uphill here. Mm. You can see that she's pushing hard. Yeah, Sarah Hagstrom had a really great world champs, fifth in the middle distance, eighth in the long distance, part of that winning relay team. 
uh, winning re re uh, forest relay and sprint relay team. She's 11 seconds quicker than Carter Davis, but hasn't sorted her way out to the next control. And she's got a compass, as you can see, on her kind of strap to her thumb. Different type of compass there. As we see Kosova in here to the finish. Denise Kosova from the Czech Republic. Is she going to be the new leading time? Yes, she is here. So Denise Kosova goes into the lead 16 seconds ahead of Isia Basse. And that is a really great result there. Okay, we have Abasold here. And if she beats Alexanderson, she could still take the overall World Cup title. Mm, it's really exciting here, the fight for the overall World Cup between Abasold and Alexanderson. Natalia Gempeler. It's dropping a she lot here out of the control. That's... No, some people have taken that line. Mm, and she has actually the chance to uh, get onto the third position, the overall overall World Cup. Hannah Lundberg is on third position there uh, with 255 points. And Natalia Gempele is 48 points behind. So quite a big gap, but still a chance. But 48 seconds behind at that point, it's not the best of starts. I wonder if, again, we haven't really seen any GPS tracking from the first part of the course. I want to know whether they've been going round or mm, not. And Maybe I'll see if I can, we can find it. Yeah, and then we don't even have the times from Denisa Kosova. We don't have any split times there so far. So we are comparing to mm. Hockström. But we don't know about Kosova's splits. But as you mentioned, not the best start here for Kempele. 48 seconds in this very beginning is quite a lot. Our last starter, Tova Alexanderson. Will we see a repeat of the men's race where we have the where we have the double from Casper Fosser? With again, those two runners had a lead of a, a similar time, about about five and a half minutes was their lead over the rest of the field after that long distance. Casper Fosser then with a minute and a half lead on this middle distance, really impressive. And Benjaminson is also behind. At this point, I think um, it Sarah Hagstrom quickest uh, so far at um, this point of the course. Mm, not the and best Benny way just not here. got the best line through there either. Right. You can see where it's tracked up here, just to the right of picture, which is better line to go down. It's just a few seconds here and there. But that's part of one of the skills of our interior, kind of looking in the terrain and seeing where it's where you're gonna what's gonna be the quickest line to run as well. She mm, looks up. Kind of surprising that she's losing 43 seconds here. Already silver medalist in the World Championships. I don't know if it would be interesting to see the route choice to the third control from those runners here. We haven't seen a lot of GPS before or in this race here. Might be some struggles with the connection of the devices. So Benjaminson, actually a really good uh, route there. Four, five, uh, sorry, three, four, five. Catching up some seconds. And Lotta Koholo is uh, also doing well. 
it is, it is still Megan Carter Davis leading at this point of the course, but I think she's dropped time from this point to the finish. And we've got her, her pre warning in at the finish, but uh, not in the lead. Yeah, and someone with a very good start. We have in the picture here, Hanna Lundberg taking the lead at the third control. Nine seconds ahead of Sara Hockstra. And uh, what a contrast for Hannah Lundberg compared to the last middle distance where that she ran on the World Cup circuit when she was the first starter. <laughs> Ended up taking the win. I just, I can't even believe still that she was the first starter. You know, she had like, she was about 805th in the world going into that race in the world rankings. Um, and was sat in that leader's chair for so long. Reaction still makes me smile. It's amazing. Here's uh, <laughs> Megan Carter Davis though. And, oh, well, I don't know what was going on there uh, in terms of her time to know whether she's in the lead or not. Uh, yes. Oh, she is in the lead. Gosh, well, my pre-warnings are all over the place then because uh, I don't know what is going on, but uh, but Megan Carter Davis looks like she's gone into a new leading time um, of 36 minutes, 28 seconds. Oh, goodness me, in which case we might have to just disbelieve all of the um, pre-warning things because she was, uh, looked like she was uh, slower but, than Isia Basse. Yeah, I think there was some something strange at her time there. We saw it in the graphics at the very beginning mm -hmm. was something with 926 uh, minutes, which obviously isn't correct. Uh, but here we have Simona Abersold and uh, we have a new leader at the third control. We do have a new leader. It is Simone Abersold, second to last starter, and it really shows. I think there's there's a small group of women that's just a class apart. Simone Abersold in there too. Of course, we're still waiting for Tova Alexanderson to go. But look at the way Simone Abersold is attacking these hills right at the early part of this course. She's followed her map up nice and small and just really attacking up these hills. Gonna. She's looking behind though. Can mm -hmm. she? Uh, can she hear Alexanderson coming? I don't know. We will wait and see what uh, the. I don't think so we, because with, we don't. With two, no, with two minutes start interval. I mean, you honestly and we have, don't to have, have to have a, like a teleport yet, so. to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was something with the camera uh, person there, um, but a very good start <laughs> here. And of course, she has to push and give everything she has. And here we have Tuve Alexanderson punching at the third control. It will be interesting to see now. Four seconds, the difference mm -hmm. between Abersold and Tuve. Uh, and we know the one winning this race of those two in the head-to-head -head will be the winner of the overall World Cup, at least if they are top five. Yeah, well, Megan, I know, well, um, Simona, sorry, I'm thinking about three things at once. Um, <laughs> Simona Abersold pulled up 10 seconds, though, just on this bit from three to five. So Alexanderson has to try and match that. And she's reading the map really carefully. And she just makes the, na the running, the physical side of things just look so, so mm -hmm. easy. No, I think it should would have been good to go a bit more to the right there. Yeah. She goes the Benjaminsen way. And we have this fight here between Tuve Alexanderson and Simone Abersold. And we also have the fight between Hanna Lundberg and uh, Andrine Benjaminsen. So advantage Alexanderson and Lundberg at the moment. But let's see if it's still the same. Uh, Pat control six or five it is here it's always hard to change from the, the women's <laughs> course uh, from the men's course to the women's course it is especially when they've got so many controls that are common we yeah. see that a lot in the world cup they were actually managed to do that quite well and have quite different courses in sweden i thought the course planning was really really good for that but it's not quite the same here so let's have a look at the gap and it's only, one, only second. one second ahead so simona abersold much better through that section vera klemetinen has just gone ahead of megan carter davis by 21 seconds so the young finn doing really well there 
in the forest as well as on the sprints. Oh, and Hagström we've got Sarah Hagstrom. And Olsson. So Sarah Hagstrom has caught Caroline Olsson here. So she is the faster of these two athletes together. They're heading towards split number two. So mm -hmm. control number 10. She was also the fastest in the race at control eight. Best time there, 26 seconds ahead of Megan Carter Davis. Carolyn also managing to stay ahead at this point. And the both of them, mm -hmm. oh, taking different routes then down also into control 15, not control Hockstrom 15. Lost control nine seconds here. This short section between control eight and 10. So everybody, of course, has now been through split number one. And it's those two at the top who will be having this head-to-head -head battle for the World Cup overall. Tova Alexanderson and Simona Abbasol. Just one second in it at the moment. Hannah Lundberg and Sarah Hagstrom are another two of the four Swedes making up the top ten. Also got, yeah, we can look down. Natalia Gempler a bit far down here in 12 plus 116 that's quite a lot for her Lena Strands down there 130 so those are I think the, the most of the surprises kind of having lost time at that section Carolyn Olsen is a bit slow, lower down there 140 Vera Klemetinen was 140 down there must have had a storming end of this uh, run because was uh, you know, m over a minute behind Megan Carter Davis at control number 10 and then has caught up, overtaken her and gone into the lead at the finish. So that's pretty uh, impressive stuff there for the Finn. Okay, let's look out for the last group of runners into the second TV split. She, Natalia Gempler has punched control number eight, mm. but she is must a long way down. Yeah, there must have been a mistake there. Two minutes and six seconds. That's too much here. And uh, as I said before, she's still in the fight for this third position in the overall World Cup, but she has to beat Hanna Lundberg. There we have Andrine Benjaminsen as well. That's uh, more interesting here. Yeah, so Benjaminsen will be close to the lead then. Yeah, she was only 15 seconds behind at control eight. But to be honest, neither of them are particularly filling me with confidence. Um. <laughs> no, not, I mean, not if you see the pictures here. If you look the way here. they're both looking around a lot, first Natalia Gempler and then Andrine Benjaminsen as well. But it's also... It's it's also in the uphill. It's it's sometimes hard to say when you have the camera on the top of the hill and mm. you're filming mm -hmm. down the hill. Uh, it's hard to say how fast they are. Uh, sometimes it's kind of smart to take some steps as well, uh, as we mentioned before, to read the map. Uh, maybe to read ahead already. And it, it looks slow in the camera, but I don't know if they lose a lot of time doing it here. Let's see. It's more I mean, how much they were looking around, though, when... Um, on their way into that control. I think if you had your head in your map, you're looking at the map the whole time, then fair enough. But there's a lot of... Yeah, but you have to... I mean, a bit you have to look around as well. If you only look at the map and not the terrain, well, it doesn't help yes, you. Then, then you'll <laughs> run into a tree. Yeah. <laughs> you'll do uh, much uh, worse uh, than run into a tree. You'll <laughs> get very lost. <laughs> Now, of course, now in this section here, I think it looks good. I agree that it uh, there was some hesitating before, but just in this section here, it actually looked okay. And we can look at these times here, uh, especially for Benjaminsen. It was 15 seconds behind before. Yeah, now she goes into the lead. Hannah 
Bowie as well. She's punched this eighth control and is in a new leading time. Seven seconds quicker than Sarah Hagstrom. But we just had a punch from Simona Abersold as well, and she's gone a minute 14 quicker than Hannah Lundberg. So that is a still a continuing fantastic start for Simona Abersold. Will Hannah Lundberg now go faster than Benjamin Minson at the next point? That's going to be the next mm. question. Uh, another question will be if Abersold continues like she does at the moment. Uh, I mean, the visibility here is quite good. If she gets around 20 mm -hmm. seconds uh, behind or like behind uh, Hannah Lundberg in the Lundberg in the terrain, she might spot her, uh, which, can, which can be a kind of a game changer, uh, especially because Tuve Alexanderson, I mean, she will not have the chance to catch someone. And in this situation here, it's mostly uh, about the feeling you get from the run. I mean, uh, they know that they are fast. They know that they haven't done any mistakes, both uh, Abersold and also to Alexanderson. But uh, of course, if Abersold, if you spot Hanna Lundberg, who, who won the last race uh, in the middle distance, then it's a good sign for you and it gives you a perfect feedback here. And I Hannah mean the Lundberg race, Lundberg. So good here and yeah. goes quickest, eight seconds quicker. Very good. It's very pressing how she is uh, impressive, how she can, uh, yeah, w what consistency she has in this season here. It's not only one race or two races, she was running good. I mean, she's in the third position in the overall World Cup here, Hannah Lundberg. And. She was born 2002, so she's still <laughs> only 19 she's years old. Yeah, she's still a junior. Uh, you know, she wasn't at the World Champs. She uh, she was went off, of course, to the Junior World Champs in Turkey, where she won the middle and the relay. And Simona Abersold here. Mm -hmm. Would be interesting to see now. The time of Tuve Alexanderson at control eight. I think we will see her in the picture very soon. Yep, I think we will. It's about two minutes to get through this whole section, but Simone Abersold went quickest there. And Tove Alexanderson, you can see 13 seconds slower now than Simone mm -hmm. Abersold. But you can also see the speed here in this uphill. It's really good. We had some some little bit hesitate. Uh, some little hesitation there by Simon Abersol just before the control. So maybe the chance to win back a few seconds here for Tuve Alexanderson. I'm just excited. There's a really real proper battle then, I think, between these two women for, for the win here. I mean, Tove Alexanderson is so good. We see her, of course, winning by five and a half minutes on Thursday in that long distance uh, of which she has been so, so dominant. But and for, for ages, especially at the World Champs, it seemed like how could anybody get close to her? How could anybody be able to match that speed? And the fact that Simone Abersold is not just doing that, but beating her here today and of course beat her on um, on Swedish home soil on at the World Cup uh, second round uh, last month. That was amazing mm -hmm. too. And yeah, she's got to careful not to drop too low actually here. Yeah, now she gets a little bit into I think this. she needs to be on the path and then go up from the path. Yeah, now you can see that she is not totally in control over the situation. She's looking around a lot here. She has also some hesitation here, but she should see the hill. I guess uh, she has the situation under control here. can see she's definitely not going to take the lead. Mm -mm. She can see she's just she looking around. There you go. Yeah, she's you could also see she was kind of relieved to see the control. <laughs> but she was actually not losing much time here. I mentioned it before. Abasol didn't look too confident into this control either. Now we have the long leg coming towards control 11.
So everyone's been through this control now. Split two, Simona Abersold with that lead, 14 seconds, and then a whole minute then back to Hannah Lundberg and through to Benny Minson, very close. Sarah Hagstrom, very close as well. Then Megan Carter Davis, who uh, was actually, is actually now into second place. Vera Klemetinen is our current leader at the finish. So all those in the top uh, page there, still in some good contention. The likes of still Natalia Gemper there, the, Natalia Gempler there, three minutes 15 down. That's put uh, price to hers. Karen Olsen also more than three minutes down. And I think to be in contention, you really need to be in that first page in the standings right now. Even though I think we've seen mistakes from, I think, Megan Carter Davis towards the end, just looking at her there. So I think mm -hmm. we've got yep. uh, Lotta Carola Lotta coming Carola. in now. Mm. She was eight seconds behind at control number 15, the last radio control, and she has a chance at least to beat Megan Carter Davis and maybe even to beat Vera Klemetinen. Will be tight though. Yeah, and she's worked well up from. Uh, Kind of being well, it's hard to tell because now you've got Simona Abbott mm. and Tova Alexanderson into the mix. But I think has has pulled up places certainly uh, and not lost too much time in the, after the first few controls. So has been running quite consistently, and we'll mm, have a look on the time. It's going to be here. really close for the lead, I think. Here, will she get it? Will she not? It's going to be so close with her teammate Vera Klemetinen just racing straight for the line. She's going to be slower, but will go into the second place. So Finland, one, two at the moment, just four seconds slower than Vera Klemetinen. And really great run there from Lotta Kola. Finn. Yeah, lots of Finnish potential there as we see uh, Paolo Gross. Was up? Paolo Gross, yes, into eighth place. And so, yeah, second and eighth there. We are waiting then soon for Carolyn Olsen and Sarah Hagstrom, who mm -hmm. we saw Sarah Hagstrom catch up. Carolyn Olsen. Victoria this is, Bjornstad. Yep, who's been caught and overtaken by both Paolo Gross Lotta Cola. So she will not be featuring, unfortunately, mm. in amongst the, the top results here. We have seen the mistake at Control 3, where she was following. Paula Gross, instead of going to the control, lost a lot of time here, but of course she knew re already in the beginning when she was caught by the other runners that it's not her day, then it's always hard, or at least harder, to keep the focus on your own decisions and to keep the focus on navigation. But she did quite a good job from the first from the first radio control, I mean, she had she was already four minutes behind there. Now we have the pre warning for Sarah Hockstrom and Karlin Olsson, and uh, I think soon we will have a new leader here. Maybe we can spot them there, we can spot them in the ah, background, yes. the two Swedish runners. Yeah, maybe move the camera. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the Bjorn all the way into the finish. You can see how many runners there are close together after this middle distance race. And now I hope we can look through to the Swedes who are coming through very, very soon. I think maybe we also had Serena Kibbutz there as well in that shot. So three of them running together. So that means Sarah Hagstrom has caught up two minutes on Carolyn Olsen and then four minutes on Serena Kibbutz. So here they are. Here she is, Sarah Hagstrom, leading out there, followed by the very familiar style, distinctive style of Carolyn Olsen. Uh, the two of them will soon punch this last control. 
And if we have a look back, yeah, very consistent times then for Saar Hagstrom. But it was really from between the first and the second intermediate that uh, the likes of Simone Abbasold and Tove Alexanderson were able to make a gap. These two here running really well, I think. We will soon see Andrew Benny Minson into the finish as well. Mm, I think we can spot them mm -hmm. back there. But let's take the leader to the finish first here, Sarah Hockstrom. Big lead here. Almost two minutes. Huge lead here then for Sarah Hagstrom to go. The first one under the expected winning time under 35 minutes. So Sarah Hagstrom will cross the line just behind her teammate Carolyn Olsen. 34-15, one minute. 52 mm -hmm. lead over Vera Klemetinen. Fantastic racing from Saar Hagstrom. And collapses on the line <laughs> next to her now. teammate. Really mm -hmm. tough running. There's uh, Serena uh, Kibbutz there as well. And now we are waiting for Andrina Benjaminsen because we will have a mm -hmm. new leader very, very soon to the finish. She is more than one minute ahead of Sara Hagstrom. And now we are in the fight for the third position in the World Cup, in the overall World Cup. Gap between Benjaminsen and Lundberg is only 25 points. I have a feeling Sara Hagstrom must have made a mistake on this last point because Andrina Benny Minson at control number 10 was only three seconds ahead of Sarah Hagstrom. Now she's one minute and six mm -hmm. seconds ahead. And Natalia Gempela was, uh, you know, two minutes behind Sarah Hagstrom and is now like 50 seconds behind Sarah Hagstrom. So there must have been a mistake, I think, there from the Swede towards the end, which is uh, hard to see, but it means that it opens the door for the likes of Andrina Benny Minson to take another big gap out of the rest of the field. You can see there she's caught up Natalia Gempela and Andrina Benny Minson again with a very consistent uh, set of performances uh, on this World Cup circuit. Means she's in the position that she's in today and vying for is she vying for a top three spots in the World Cup overall. Mm, there's a chance. I mean, there's a fight between Andrina Benjaminsen and Hanna Lundberg. At the moment, we have the advantage for Hanna Lundberg, but um, it Oof. will be, it could be a tight one here, actually, depending on the race of Hanna Lundberg, who we expect to be at the pre morning very soon as well. Yeah, she's the next uh, runner who started after Benny Minson, so we should have her at the pre warning really, really soon. Benny Minson, though running all the way through to the finish really strong runner forest runner and she's going to take a big scalp out of sarah hagstrom put down a big mark there but we know of course we've got simone absol tova alexanderson to come great result though for benjamin's not an easy thing to do to catch up natalia gempela and really take some distance out of her on the run-in as well fighting hard to the line takes a new leading time there Andrea Benjaminson from Norway. And Natalia Gempela will cross in, I think, probably third, fourth, maybe even fifth spot, actually. Mm. Third spot, and there now, you can see. Sorry. Actually, the thing happened that uh, mentioned before, I see when Abbasol has almost caught Hanna Lundberg. They're both at the pre warning new now. And. Uh, we have, will have a new leader very soon, Simona Abersold, and then we have to wait two minutes to see who <laughs> will win the overall World Cup 2021. Here they are. Here they are indeed, and you can see then that, as exactly as you said, Simona Abersold has overtaken Hannah Lundberg. I think that means Hannah Lundberg will be out of the medals, I think just about. Um, yeah, she should be slower than Andrina Benjaminson. 
And Simona Aversold is looking very good to take the new leading time. And then it will be a very anxious couple of minutes to see what Tova Alexanderson has done in this last little loop. Because we haven't really seen much of the GPS tracking. We think we've already seen a mistake from Sarah Hagstrom in that particular part of the course as well. But now Aversold is really fighting hard. She has taken her first ever World Cup win this season in the uh, long distance in Sweden, of course, beating Tova Alexanderson in the process. And can she do it a second time? Well, it's going to be very, very soon out of her control. She's just got to work really hard on this last section. It's such a long, painful run-in. I would absolutely hate it if it were me. And uh, we will be waiting to see whether it's going to be enough for Simona Aversold to be able to take the win here. Mm, at so least I can say I'm quite confident that it will be enough for Hanna Lund maybe to save this third spot in the overall World Cup because she will just be behind Andrina Benjaminsen here, which is not enough for Benjaminsen. But the most interesting part is the one is the fight between Abersolt and Tove Alexanderson. Hannah Lundberry then still a junior and she's gonna come home in third place. And there was some blue just behind there. I think Tova Alexanderson is on the chase. We've had the pre-warning. Let's just say it's pretty close between the two of them. But Abersold in here to take the new leading time. But will it be enough compared to Tova Alexanderson? She takes the lead and now she's just got to wait two minutes to see if she will take the overall World Cup title. She's a minute and five seconds quicker than the Norwegian, than Andrina Benjamins and Hannah Lundberg will go into. Yes, she is into that third place. She's defended that third place. We've just got one runner left to go and they have given it everything mm -hmm. here on the really and long, grueling running. But we're waiting now for Tova Alexanderson, who we can, has punched we can the pre-warning control. Hannah Lundberg has this third position for sure mm -hmm. now. So in the World Cup standings, yes. In the World yes. Cup, yeah, yes. of course. All right, here, here she is, Tova Alexanderson. This and will she be enough. Was slightly ahead, as you can see, at the pre-warning control. And 14 seconds, I think, is too much to lose. And here. she's going to take this win. Yeah, what a fight between between the two. It was the fight all season long. And you can see how disappointed <sighs> Abersold is. It was a fight all season long. Five points difference before the last race. And now it's a matter of sec seconds. It is a matter of seconds, but Tova Alexanderson is working hard. She pulled up 28 seconds on that last part of the race. Fantastic descent down the slopes from Tova Alexanderson. And Abersold is there to give her a round of applause as she takes uh, the win here today. Another win for Tova Alexanderson, 23 seconds ahead of Simona Abersold. And with that, she is back again, once again on the top of the podium and has taken the overall World Cup standings. Congrats mm -hmm. to Tove Alexanderson. That was yeah. a tighter battle than I thought it was going to be. So, C yeah, congratulations yeah. to Tove. And I think the the fact that she she can't really uh, yeah take the congratulation of Simona there because she's so tired is maybe the biggest compliment you can give to Abersold in this position. Yeah. She had to fight all the way to the finish and. Well, if we look back at the season, uh, I think very well deserved. She was the big name at the World Championships, and then she had this uh, struggles with the coronavirus. She, st she struggled in Sweden. She skipped one of the races there, um, and now she could win it anyway. So that's a very another very great performance by Tove Alexanderson and uh, it's just very good to see that it's so tight in women's orienteering that we can have so exciting races uh, between the two of them and I think it's good for for 
Yeah, it's good for us as spectators, but mm. it's also good. I, I think that both of them, Abisold and Alexanderson, uh, enjoy that very much. I don't think they are the kind of uh, person who, who want to be dominating. Uh, I th yeah, of course they want to do it, but I think they they really like the fact that there's a big fight for this um, for this yeah place on top of the World Cup and. Uh, well, it's good for everyone, it's good for the sport, and uh, yeah, as I said, it's good for us as the spe spectators. Yeah, exactly. It means so much more to win something where you've had to work really hard for it, where you've you've had to push yourself and you know it's not an easy win. And uh, maybe maybe it was a bit on the long distance, but it certainly wasn't on this middle distance. Really, really fighting hard. And if we just look down the results, I mean, Hannah Lundberg with that fourth place again really shows there's no fluke with her uh, orienteering um, after that uh, Swedish World Cup. Uh, two fins in the top 10 with Vera Klemetinen and Lotta Kaholo is it's really really fantastic and I think they're really buoyed by the the news that they'll soon have Thierry Georgi as their uh, team coach I think they've got they've got a lot of motivation and they've worked really hard to to do that we've got Isia Basse with a great uh, 12th place in there as well but let's of course have this confirmation then of the uh, World Cup points uh, from 2021 so Tova Alexanderson 505 points Simona Abasold as we said second place Hannah Lindbergh defending that third place she's still a junior and Drina Benjaminson I think a well-deserved fourth place a lot of consistency for her as well and Eleanor Ross still in eighth place not even racing in these last couple mm -hmm. of uh, rounds of the World Cup uh, not here in Italy unfortunately she was in church so she couldn't come here medals in the world championship earlier this year and now world cup winner how does it feel oh it feels so good i'm so happy with the weekend and the work i have done the last two weeks and come back after covid and it has just been so fun to be here and compete again and it has been yeah, amazing terrain and fun orienteering it was so close between you and simona abasol to the very end can you tell us about the race today yeah i I knew that it would be tight and that uh, I needed to do a really good performance and I, I am really satisfied with my race today and um, I have done some small on some places but I have always been really focused in orienteering and not any mistakes just some uh, place I have been had to stop and maybe come a little bit not where I wanted to be but any big mistakes so I'm I'm really satisfied with my race yeah it's so almost a perfect race today uh, yeah I will look at the map later you always <laughs> find some things and I did some smaller mistakes but I was so focused and didn't stress up uh, by the small things and just uh, yeah I did exactly what I wanted to do so I'm really happy with that Thank you very much to Alexander Son and congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> so I think probably what we would expect um, to hear there from Tove Alexanderson with, um, I would say, kind of summing up the, the nature of this race in that it wasn't really about big mistakes, particularly, although of course we'll have seen some, but it was mostly about can you get that feeling of of progressing well through the terrain, not making too many hesitations, because if, if you're doing, I guess, as we said, two seconds on every control, that's 40 seconds on the men's race and uh, could cost you a medal, something like that. It's being able to keep that speed high when there's so much detail. Of course, she says she'll go back and have a look and maybe uh, maybe mm. it's not going to be quite as perfect race as maybe the interviewer is suggesting, because I'm sure um, <laughs> that's what the top orienteers do. They like to pick holes in their own races. <laughs> but um, a, a standout performance from today, is it this man? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, it is this man. It was maybe the biggest surprise today. Uh, finally, he got his race where he got everything together and he ended up in the third position. Um, another one to highlight, I, I mean, we have to do it every time because she's still a junior, is Hannah Lundberg. She's not only ending up in fourth position today, but she's also ending up in third position in the overall World Cup. So I think those two um, performances today, they were outstanding. And then, of course, we had this big fight between uh, Tove Alexanderson and Simona Abersold, which is always 
a pleasure to follow and um, I mean it 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 needed this almost perfect race of Tuve Alexanderson to actually win the overall World Cup because Simona, Simona Abersol she did what she had to do uh, if you follow the split times she was three seconds behind in the beginning then she was in the lead at control um, third, uh, 10 and then it, it was just changing and then up and down all the way but they were very close to each other so it was really a head to head not only the whole season but also in the race today. Yeah, and for a lot of times this season, we've seen Tova Alexanderson win despite making a big mistake. Mm -hmm. And today she won with a pretty clean race. So I mm -hmm. think that mm -hmm. kind of shows that, that those women were on such a top form today and having to compete to their best. And that's what we like to celebrate is not just great success, but people just doing great orienteering. Mm. Um, I mean, it's it's hard to say for us. We didn't really see much of the work they were doing out in the forest, so it's it's hard to really analyze their runs. Also, we have to go back and look at the performances <laughs> later on when you have the GPS yeah. Uh, yeah. of uh, two of Alexander and Simona Abersol. But uh, uh, what we can see here from the split times and how close the race is, and also what Tuve Alexanderson is was telling us, it uh, yeah, it must have been. Uh, uh, yeah, an almost perfect race. Of course, you you would never like you as an orienteer. You never want to say that you had the perfect race because it's <laughs> kind of giving up your dream <laughs> to always be, get better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You always want to improve, don't you? And it kind of yeah. ruins the fun, doesn't it? If you have um, if you have too too many good uh, performances, you got nowhere to go from there. You know, we, if you hark back to Thierry Georgiou's very famous one second mistake that um, <laughs> that he put in his analysis of the race. Yeah, he, he's able to anal analyze it so much that he's allow allowed to get a one second mistake. That's just uh, absolutely crazy. But I think it's a reflection of how how seriously, so, uh, you know, a lot of the top orienteers take this and how much they want to be, um, you know, improving and improving and because they know that they have to keep up their up in their game alongside everybody else it has to be uh in they have to be in control so yeah right we're gonna get the uh flower ceremony then for the men's and the women's races uh probably starting with the men's then moving on to the women's and um so in third place we will have in the men's class representing the home nation of Italy. It is Riccardo Scaletti, and Jonas, you said it. He's been working so hard and had put together, you know, some races nearly there. Showed he, he has had a lot of potential, but to come away and, and get this third place in a home um, a home World Cup is must be unbelievable feeling. We have Matthias Kiberts then into a second place, rounding off another great season for him, particularly strong at the World Champs. And then of course, taking the second win at this meet, again with an impressive margin of victory. One minute and 24 seconds, Kasper Fosser just seems unbeatable in this terrain so so quick so strong and Casper Fosser taking the win taking the World Cup overall title as well and full of confidence as we head into tomorrow's sprint relay we saw he him being instrumental for Norway in the relays at the World Championships I'm sure he will be there too again tomorrow in that sprint relay so congrats to those three. I mean, is is Casper Fossa the high, you know on the men's side the highlight performance across the whole season? Yeah, I mean, it's almost that you you would like to go and get a hat just to take it off again. It's it's such uh, great performances by him. Uh, all I mean uh, during the whole season, he was so dominating, especially like the the long distances. Uh, it's something we have seen of by Olaf Lundenes earlier. Uh, the way he opened the race at the World Championships there, he just dominated 
every control in the beginning and he did kind of the same uh, on Thursday again. He has such a high speed, especially in long distances. And uh, something interesting he mentioned is kind of the middle distance boss if there was one weak point in his performances, then it was uh, the middle distances, but also there, I mean, he had, uh, I think it was the fourth position at the fifth position at the World Championships, and he was still up there, he was still in contention, there are so many uh, guys who can be good in middle distances, so it's he's really dominating at the moment. And Julian Benjaminson then with the third place, another World Cup top three for her. Fantastic racing. Simona Abasold then goes into second place. Hasn't even managed to, uh, she, she's still got her SI unit and everything there. Uh, quick, quick turnaround for these flower ceremonies, but oh, goodness me, didn't she give Tove Alexanderson a fantastic race? It wasn't to be for her today. And Tova Alexanderson is back to the top of the podium again, taking two from two in this competition. Only mm. beatable this season when she had COVID. I mean, after just after having COVID, I mean, that just it, it needed a, a virus to go and uh, to go and kind of allow the others maybe to 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 catch up and, and take any wins and allow anybody any edge into that competition. She's been so fantastic and will continue to be. I'm I'm hoping for many many mm. more years to come. I mean, uh, there, it, we have been talking a lot about Tuve and uh, Simona Abersolt, uh, mm. but also Andrina Benjaminson mm -hmm. is such a consistent runner throughout the whole season. And it, I get the feeling that she got a little bit closer uh, to the two leading girls here. Um, the gap before was bigger for sure. It's just that they are so like they are so good. Uh, it's hard. It, sometimes you almost forget how. On, a, on what level Benjaminson mm. is performing oh, here throughout yeah. the whole season. And she's only one minute 28 behind. She uh, took the silver medal, if I'm right, in the middle distance at the World Championships. Mm -hmm. So she's, she is up there, but the focus is so often on uh, Alexanderson <laughs> or Abersol that it's easy to forget her. But it, uh, yeah, we have more names now in the women's uh, competitions. We have Benjaminson, Lundberg, Hagström, Kemperle, Abersold and Alexanderson, so it's it's really opening up here as well, and that makes it very interesting for us. Yeah, it really does. Yeah, she's she got the silver distance, silver medal in the middle distance of the World Champs, second in the long distance in Sweden at the World Cup, and really, yeah, we she does seem like we ignore her and and it but she, yeah you're so right she does is racing on a fantastic level and particularly this year but has had a number of great results in the years previously as well but really seems to be breaking in and mm. and i hope she can just kind of continue improving and improving now yeah maybe maybe the difference is that she she doesn't really have the the consistency in every kind of terrain sometimes mm -hmm. there she has some races where she can lose quite a lot of time or where she is not really up there that's the difference uh, basically to alexanderson and Abersold, who are they are on top like in top three or five in every race and uh, if benjaminson continues to work uh on that, uh, as she was the last year, uh, years, I think it will be even tighter the coming years and we will see many more exciting races. Yeah, well, we've got one more race of the World Cup still to come with a sprint relay tomorrow. See all the different nations battling it out. Multiple teams per nation. It's going to be very, very fast down in Cortina and hopefully some fantastic racing as well. Lots of chopping and changing. We'll be back to bring you that one tomorrow, but we will leave you with some pictures from today's forest. We'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, see you tomorrow.